Welcome everyone. I, Council President Walsh, call the February 12th City Council Committee of the Whole meeting to order. As a reminder, we continue to have a remote aspect to our meetings. So tonight we have Council Member Ray and some members of staff as well as potentially the public who may be participating in tonight's meeting remotely via WebEx. The first item on our agenda is public comment. And so at this point, members of the public may address council at this time in person or virtually. Those who signed up in advance to make comments will be called on first. Um, if you're joining us virtually and would like to make comments, please raise your virtual hand or send the host a chat message. If you're on the phone, you're gonna look for star three. If you've joined by computer or smartphone, look for the hand icon. If you're in the room and did not sign up to speak, I will ask for others, um, other speakers before closing this portion of the meeting. So, oh, clerk, has anyone signed up to speak for comments tonight? Council President, nobody has signed up previously to speak, and we didn't have no virtual attendees at this time. Okay, and do we have anyone who would like to make comments? Like no. So, as a reminder, written comments can be submitted at any time. Just email citycouncil at issaquawa.gov. Okay. Looking through. The next item on our agenda is ID 1610, Cascade Water Alliance Water Supply Contract Options, presented by Chuck Clark, Cascade Water Alliance, and started out by Emily Moon. Thank you Thank very you. much. Good evening, City Council. Uh, we do have a guest this evening. Chuck Clark is the lead contracts negotiator for Cascade Water Alliance, and he will be presenting uh, the bulk of the presentation tonight. I did want to just introduce the item and introduce Chuck. Also, Matt Ellis, our utilities engineering manager, is here with me tonight. Matt has been representing uh, city staff at many of the Cascade board meetings where they have been discussing uh, these potential uh, contracts. So tonight, the purpose of our meeting is to give you a first opportunity to learn more about what Cascade has been discussing and to share an overview of the contract proposals from Seattle Public Utilities and Tacoma Water District for long-term water supply in our region. Tonight, because this is an early first opportunity for some conversation, we're hoping that you might be able to share any thoughts, considerations, any concerns that you might have or, or pose questions about this uh, water supplier uh, contract solicitation and selection process. And then ultimately, at the end of the meeting, I will be asking if you have any thoughts or considerations or questions about the administration's plan approach to providing city council with updates on this project and on the future negotiations with the selected vendor. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chuck Clark. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, um, and thank you all for the opportunity for uh, at least bringing up to speed on some of the discussions that have been going on with both Seattle and Tacoma. Maybe a brief comment about uh, how I got back involved in the discussions, the contract uh, solicitation discussions. Um, first, I actually used to be the CEO for Cascade Water and was brought back in an acting capacity last May for through um, October, um, back to that position again. And then after that, uh, I am no longer the acting CEO, but I am uh, working with the board uh, as the uh, lead person discussing the solicitations with both Seattle um, and Tacoma. Actually, before that, um, I was the director of Seattle Public Utilities <laughs> and was the direct, uh, was the deputy mayor in Seattle for, um, for a while, and before that, ran the regional office of EPA and State Department of Ecology. So I've been involved in the water issues for a long period of time, but spent a long time working with Cascade and actually came in front of the city council years ago as the director of Seattle Public Utilities when Issaquah was trying to decide whether to stay 
with Seattle Public Utilities or to join Cascade. And I made a presentation at the time over the benefits of staying with Seattle and Isacola decided to go with Cascade. So um, that chased me to Cascade. So you were, you're part of that. But um, for us, uh, the board uh, wanted to entertain a discussion with anybody interested in taking a look at what water might be available um, in the future. So uh, go ahead, Matt. Let's start the presentation. Um, the purpose really is to give you a, a quick overview on Cascade. Uh, some of the discussion of what the current contract terms look like, um, why we're even looking at solicitations now, um, and what the uh, purpose of that is, an overview of what we have heard um, and received from both Seattle and Tacoma in, uh, in solicitations, uh, some of the preliminary recommendations, uh, uh, specifics that we've given to the board, uh, potential construction impacts and impacts that could occur the Issaquah in uh, the future, um, and then some discussion of a board timeline for decisions. Next, Matt. Um, as many of you may know, um, Seattle, Cascade is one of the four what are called the big water suppliers um, in, King, uh, in the region, Seattle, Everett, Tacoma, um, and Cascade. Uh, we are about 25% of Seattle's uh, customer base and use base. Um, we were created in uh, 1999, partly out of frustration by a number of wholesale customers over their relationship with the city of Seattle. Um, and so as I started as the director of C Seattle Public Utilities, I heard a lot about the frustration of the wholesale customers, and that ended up uh, resulting in the creation um, of Cascade. Seven, it ended up with seven member agencies. It at one time was uh, eight. Um, Covington was part. Covington purchased its way out of being a member um, of Cascade, and so it continues now to be seven uh, members. Uh, governed by a board of directors that gives specific policy direction to the staff at Cascade. Um, so all policy is determined by the board, um, and they direct Cascade over what um, they, their expectations are and what they want the staff to be undertaking. Um, as part of the early um, formation of Cascade, as many of you know, they uh, purchased Lake Taps, um, which has been owned and operated by Cascade now for over a decade, um, and is, was purchased really as an insurance policy to the future um, that may or may not be used for water supply depending upon the impacts of climate change, depending upon the impacts of future water supply issues, demand and supply both. Next slide. Um, we currently have a contract um, with Seattle. Um, it's called a block contract. Um, we pay for 33.3 million gallons uh, of water a year. Um, it's called a take or pay contract. We pay for 33.3 regardless of whether we use that or not. We actually pay at a slight discount over what uh, the other wholesale customers pay for that um, contract. We currently average about 28 million gallons a day of water use. So as you can tell, we, we pay for 33, we use 28, but because of the discount, we're actually paying slightly less than we would have paid if you were a member of uh, a wholesale member uh, in uh, still with Seattle. Um, the block contract that we have uh, with Seattle starts to decline in 2039, um, which means at this point, if you're going to start taking a look at what you may need in the future, building like taps or some other uh, future supply, you need to start taking a look at that now so that you have enough lead time to deal with that. The contract with Seattle ends at 2063. Between 2039 and 2063, it slowly declines over time. And it, starting in, at the end of 2063, there's about 5.3 million gallons still uh, that are going to be purchased from Seattle. The rest um, will no longer be purchased from Seattle. Next. Uh, question always is, why negotiate now? Um, part of the issue is 
when you take a look at the Seattle contract slowly ramping down, you take a look at what uh, demand looks like, and the demand net line now is more the kind of yellow amberish color line, um, which still may be slightly high, um, but shows that there are some challenges in the um, in the out years if, if you don't start taking a look at Lake Taps. So if you take Lake Taps off completely um, right now, uh, you'll see that there are problems with um, with having enough supply. So the issue. Uh, and the reason to start taking a look now is, one, it takes 20 years if you're going to plan to do something with uh, Lake Tavs. But two, um, if either Seattle or Tacoma are interested in providing additional water in the future, you need to lock that water up as soon as possible so that you uh, are not forced into too early into looking at building uh, uh, Lake Taps and building treatment at Lake Taps. Next slide. Um, when you look at the region as a whole, um, you know, you saw the, the previous slide that says, oh, we may have some challenges. But if you look at the region as a whole and you look at aggre what's called aggregate water supply, what's available in the region when you look at um, both north uh, to Everett, Snohomish County, you look south to Tacoma, and you look at Seattle, you'll see that even with current forecasts and aggregate forecasts, which are fairly high, there still is a lot of water in the region as a whole. Um, and one of the challenges is how do you maximize the use of all the regional water um, before you step off a cliff of building additional supply? Um, and the, the perp if you think about electrical utilities, for example, most the inner ties, they move electrons all over. Um, in dealing with electrical supply. In this region, we have the flexibility of having sufficient water that in the long run, if you can figure out a way to have a regionalized system, you can be able to move those molecules of water throughout the region and it, they won't have a flavor. They don't, it isn't Everett water or Seattle water or Cascade water or Tacoma water, it's regional water and it would, it results in both a better environmental solution, but also a better economic solution um, in dealing with water that's currently already available. Next slide. When the board asked uh, the staff to take a look at contract extensions, they put some principles in place or objectives that they would like to see. Um, they said to the staff, go out and talk to Seattle and Tacoma, see if you can get a minimum of a 20-year term or longer because that then delays the need to develop uh, Lake Taps. Um, get, see if you can get reasonable and predictable costs. So if you get an extension from Seattle or an extension from Tacoma, can you get reasonable and predictable costs um, in dealing with that? Um, it, it wants, they want us to be more effective, cost effective than building out Lake Taps. So, don't just go out and get uh, an agreement in place, but rather put something in place that is an economic benefit to all of our customers. They want a flexibility to adapt to changing circumstances. In other words, in 15 or 20 years, can you put certainty in the system for some medium term, but provide flexibility to future elected decision makers, the board members of Cascade and you all, in having additional choices in the future? One of the reasons Cascade was established was to give flexibility and certainty, was to give all of its members the ability to make choices over where they wanted, uh, where they could get the best um, and most uh, appropriate deal for water supply rather than being solely tied to Seattle. That was a principle for why Cascade was established and they wanted us to, to honor that principle going forward. And then they wanted to look and see if there's some way that this could lead to regional opportunities and maybe the initial stages of kind of regionalization of the system. Um, uh, can we start down that path of having a more regionalized system for the Puget Sound area? Next slide. Um, we've gotten some proposals back from Seattle. Um, we got a, Seattle was willing to give a 10 year um, guaranteed extension uh, from 2040 to 2049. Um, they uh, 
said that they would offer, also offer maybe two five-year extensions beyond that, but they wouldn't guarantee those extensions. Um, for the first 10-year extension, they wanted a $14 million, which I called a penalty payment, um, but a payment be, because uh, we get are paying less unit costs than the other wholesale customers. They wanted to make up that difference, um, and so they wanted a $14 million additional payment. The, they said, we guarantee you another five years if you give us another $20 million um, in penalty payments, so that, that helps make up that difference. Um, and then they offered a 40-year, if the 10-year uh, actually worked, and if they were able to do the two five-year extensions, and they put some, some conditions on those that, if I was to give, to give you percentages, I say the 10 years 100% guaranteed, the five-year, first five-year extensions about probably 80, 85% uh, uh, risk of, uh, and the second five years probably about 70 or 75 year, 75% uh, chance of getting that. And the 40-year extension with the conditions they put on is about a 10% chance you'd be able to get that 40-year extension. Um, they put a number of conditions on including a regional, <laughs> a regionalized system. Um, so they put the conditions they put in place and the premium they put on, which was 25% rate premium, um, would, make it, uh, it would make it difficult to do that. Tacoma, on the other hand, um, offered a 20-year uh, guaranteed contract, uh, actually till last Friday. Now they're somewhere between 25 and 35 years. Um, of a guarantee. They've been working through their system to see what they might be able to provide, including both what your average uh, uh, use is and also what your peak use is. And they've decided they have more, one, more uh, water than they thought they had. Um, and so right now they're up to a 25 to 35 year extension um, and, we're, and would be willing to sit down and look at, uh, talk to us about being able to do that. So when I go through some of the numbers today, uh, some of the benefits are actually better for the Tacoma proposal after last Friday um, than they were when we put this presentation together earlier last week. Next slide. Yeah, go ahead. Chuck Clark, thank you. Um, this has been very informative. Um, was there a, under, under the uh, Seattle contract, for the first five-year extension, it was going to cost $20 million is there a charge to the second five-year extension? No. At all? No. None why, to the, why'd they do that? <laughs> well, they, because the first year, the first five-year extension, um, they said if you want uh, to make sure that you get that uh, five-year extension, uh, we'll get, we're willing to guarantee that, but it'll cost you $20 million. We're not going to guarantee the second five-year extension. So they wouldn't charge us because they won't guarantee it. Um, so you're, you're paying a premium, basically, to get them to guarantee they would give you that first five-year extension. Okay, thanks. Thank yep. you for that clarification. Yep. From a capital needs perspective, because this drives some decisions about capital needs, um, and with Seattle 10, 15, 20-year extensions, there's no uh, capital needs prior to building uh, Lake Taps. So you build, you look at the schedule, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and Lake Taps would then have to be built out uh, when, at some point in that period, depending on what happens with the 50 and 20 year extension. Um, the 40 year op option, if it was available, um, actually is a pretty good option. It, you could avoid building Lake Taps. The risk is it just won't be available. Um, and so you would be making decisions now based on something that has a high risk, which they've agreed has a high risk. From a Tacoma perspective, um, phase one, uh, and you'll see the map here, and, and I'll come back to this later because this is where it's an issue for, particularly for, potentially for Issaquah. Um, lake, the Lake Taps build out would occur in two phases. The first phase would just be transmission because you would be building a transmission line that would allow you to move Tacoma water north. And there are what's called a central segment and a north segment. The, the issue at this point is uh, you can probably get away with only building the central segment 
if you're able to work out an agreement with Seattle to use the existing distribution system. Um, and that's one of the challenges uh, when you look at these maps. You'll see that there's a spur um, leading to Issaquah here. That's part of the north alignment. That, that never assumed that there could be an agreement to, with Seattle to, do, to use the existing system. And so you would build uh, a pipeline uh, to Issaquah, partly part of which is, is in the ground because it was done when there was a transportation project, I don't know, five, six, ten, probably ten years ago now. So there's a small segment of pipe that's actually sitting in the ground um, and has been mothballed um, since it was put in. But the preference is you you look at uh, the, you'll see two green lines on there. The, four, the northern one which says north and central transmission pipe. That's where we would connect to the Tacoma system and come north. If you look at the, that segment, that, the orange segment that leads up towards what's called Lake Young's, that's the lake down there, that, that runs right next to and then into the distribution system that uh, is currently used to give water to the east side. Um, and the, easy, the best of all alternatives, if you were doing a regionalized system, is you just build that line, connect to the existing distribution line, and you distribute water the same way you've distributed it historically. That's the preferred alternative. Um, the question is, would CL allow you to, in essence, what they call wheel water, uh, put water into that system and distribute it? And um, that would be the question that would have to be dealt with, but that's the preference. If you can't do that, then what happens is you look at the alignment to Issaquah, and that requires, it's a little more complicated, um, because you then have to reverse the flow in the Bellevue Issaquah pipeline and run water back the other way um, from what it runs uh, today. Next slide. Uh, before we yep, move ahead. on, we've got a question, okay. Councilmember Martz. Yeah. yeah, you said something, and maybe I, maybe I <clears throat> heard it wrong. Okay. You said something to the effect of waiting to use Lake Taps, the risk is that it wouldn't be available? No, I, the, Did I you would want to put... Wait, the preference really is never to have to use Lake Taps if you can figure out a way to use the water regionally um, because there should be sufficient water in the region to be able to deal with that. And I think future decision makers are going to have to make choices about that. I just wanted to make sure there's no, I mean, Lake Taps, it's not like somebody else would come along and poach Lake Taps, no. right? No. We've got. We have the water right. Um, that, I think the challenges for Lake Taps, like the challenges for Seattle, Tacoma, and others, is we're going to have to look over the long run at what the implications of climate change may be, mm -hmm. the, the implications of the glaciers um, on Mount Rainier, which feed part of the White River system. So there are those things that you'll have to uh, consider as you look to the future. Um, but uh, we are in sole control of Lake Taps at this point. Excellent. So. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Hall. Dead Mike, um, thank you. Uh, so, in what I heard too was that the risk was that the forty-year option might not be available to mm -hmm. us. So, can you describe what that risk is? It's just that Seattle's need might be more than they anticipate, and so they wouldn't be able. They to put they put a number of conditions into the forty-year agreement that uh, it would require them to have built to have developed a regional system. So they they will have had to build inner ties, which they have done. They've not talked to anybody nor do, done any discussions on. And, uh, or they would have to develop an additional water supply source. And they're looking at additional water supply sources. They've said they don't have water available now um, to, for that 40-year supply. And so they would have to meet a series of conditions for developing additional supply to make that 40-year available. And then if the 40-year is available, you need to pay a premium um, to be able to, to um, have that water. And uh, you Cascade can't have that 40-year agreement. Only your individual members can have that 40-year agreement. Um, they don't particularly like Cascade um, as a whole. Um, so they have said it has to be the individual members would be able to have um, join uh, Seattle. And the problem it creates for individual members is you still would own Lake Taps, and you'd still be paying for operation and maintenance of Lake Taps, and then 
if you joined Seattle, you would have a premium to pay for that water supply. So it, it creates something that is probably not really financially feasible. Um, next slide. Uh, from a capital needs draft timeline, you can look at, from a Tacoma perspective, we'd start, if you did a Tacoma agreement because you're starting to take a look at building a pipeline, the planning work really starts in 25 and 26. Uh, project delivery uh, prep starts in 27 through 30, and then you'll see project uh, delivery in 31 through 40. Part of the, if you go back when that, I showed you that map, that middle, se that middle segment from the Tacoma uh, pipeline to up near Lake, um, Lake Young's, we've already, I think we're at about a 90, we own 90% of that right away or easements now uh, already for that segment. We don't for the other segments, but for that one we do. Um, and so there isn't as much property issues associated with that portion of the segment um, as there would be if we ha have to do a northern alignment. With the Seattle, if, they, if we got the 10-year extension, it buys us a little bit of time because we don't have to start building a pipeline for the Tacoma water, but it only buys you really about five years. Um, so because you, you're still going to have to go off, and since they'll only guarantee you 10 years, you can't wait and find out whether someday in the future they're willing to give you additional water. You're going to have to start planning and building um, because if you wait, the risk is on you. I mean, what's happened is with the Seattle discussions, they've tried to shift most all the risk to Cascade, um, and that's create that's creates challenges because you have to make individual decisions on dealing with that. Matt, next slide. Uh, the financials, um, roughly. Uh, the 10 year extension from Seattle is worth about $53 million um, uh, for Cascade under the existing contract, even with the slight premium we pay. Um, the two five year conditional extensions, if we were able to get them, which uh, is right now an unknown, is worth about another $132 uh, million. And then the 40-year extension will be worth 900 million. It's it's a valuable asset because you wouldn't build like taps through 2100. I mean, it it puts a long extension on there. For for Tacoma, um, the 25 if you had a 25-year contract, it's worth about roughly 300 million. Um, it probably worth a little bit more than that now. We'll have to run the numbers on it after last Friday. So I, I'm not sure how much of it. Uh, benefit will be, but it'll be worth more than the 300 million. The other issue is, to be honest, if you're really making a 20-year extension uh, decision, you're going to be making another one in the future. And when you make another one in the future, there is water maybe from Tacoma. Then Seattle, more than likely, will be looking at if they did have water at that time, you could entertain again because uh, you're still using Seattle water. Uh, you can look at using Seattle water again um, or building Lake Taps. So what you're doing is just you're finding the best deal you have available at the time and then still leaving your options open for a decision in the future. Next slide. Um, just to give you a, a feel for um, what this looks like, really through about the next um, 15, 16 years, the Tacoma deal is significantly better from a cost perspective, um, even with the work you're doing on the construction, um, than, uh, than the Seattle deal. Then, uh, if you were able to get uh, the Seattle agreements, they start getting better, but not for about 15 or 20 years. Um, and that's because the terms that, <laughs> that Tacoma has offered are about 75% of the cost of Seattle water. Um, even though we get a discount from Seattle, this is Tacoma water is even discounted further. Um, and so it provides really for about the next 15 or 20 years a much uh, better return for um, Cascade members and for their customers. And so um, it, the one thing on here that we've not dealt with at all is any rate smoothing. This is just purely a conversion of all the decisions into what the, the costs are year by year basis, you would want to be rate smoothing and figuring out how to 
deal, as you well know, because you probably rate smooth all, all the time, um, you'll have to deal with rate smoothing as you, as you go forward. Next slide. Um, the, I think we can probably skip this one because I've already done that, so let's go on to the next one. Uh, so the preliminary recommendation we gave to uh, the board was to uh, to take a look in more detail at the Tacoma uh, offer. It provided longer supply certainty with flexibility to make decisions in the future. It was more cost effective than anything in the Seattle's 10-year proposal or the 15-year proposal um, when they put the penalties in. Uh, it lower construction risk and time to adapt to changing circumstances, so it buys us some time. Um, and it leads towards the first step in actual regionalization uh, of the Puget Sound water supply system because you put a pipeline in place. And to be honest, when Seattle talked about a 40 year extension, what they talked about was putting a pipeline in place to Tacoma. So it would already uh, be in place and would allow the opportunities to deal with that as we look to the future. Um, the construction impacts uh, for Issaquah, and I, one of the reasons this is not uh, high on my priority list was because I drove it when I first started at Cascade 15 years ago and looked at the alignment. Things have changed since then, um, but it has a, a mile of pipeline in the SR 900 corridor, and what we would look at now, because things are different than they were a decade ago, is probably micro tunneling um, because you're not building, a, it's not a huge pipe. And so you would look at something trying to figure out a way not to disturb um, the, as much as you could do not to disturb the highway issues because we know what that would be like. And um, I think, again, it isn't the preferred alternative because the preferred alternative is, is to use pipeline that's already in existence. And um, basically what that may require is some legislative action to um, require Seattle to, to wheel in their system. Um, and that would be something that we would take a look at. Next slide. Um, for the board discussions, uh, we're looking at March or April, just to get some further direction from the board, whether they want us. All you've seen now is kind of what we've gotten, the solicitations we've gotten back from Seattle and Tacoma. You've seen um, what our preliminary recommendation is, but we would be asking the board um, probably in that timeline, you want us to pursue a detailed discussion with Tacoma on co what the contract would look like and what the terms and conditions would be. Um, and if that's the case, then we would sit down and take a look at those uh, terms and conditions. If they, if they said, no, we want you to stay with Seattle, well, it'd be the same thing. We'd sit down with Seattle and have those discussions. We're looking at some board authorization sometime in the fall of uh, 2024. Um, so there's, we're trying to provide as much time as possible so that we can get all the questions and issues uh, out on the table and discuss, give the board an opportunity. You're actually the first um, council or district I presented to. Um, actually, tomorrow night I'm in Redmond, I think. And over the next month, I will have uh, been out to all seven of the uh, member uh, organizations, uh, councils, or commissions uh, making this presentation so that everybody gets as much information as possible. We've made this as public as we possibly can. Um, some have argued we've made it public because it hits Seattle and Tacoma against each other. Uh, we've argued we've made it public because we want everybody to see all this information. This was the reason Cascade was established, was to allow the members to be able to make decisions about the future and about where and how they want to receive their water supply. And this, this point is like one of the points before when Lake Taps was purchased. It's a major decision. Uh, that all the members will have to decide whether this is what they want, um, what they want for Cascade. And to be honest, you know, there's not a, it's not really a black and white, right or wrong decision. They're, these are just choices to make. They are, they drive different costs, different construction, they drive different issues. But they, at the end of the day, the board's just going to have to decide what choice they want to make going forward and where they want to get that water. And that's it for my presentation. Excellent. So we'll start with questions. Councilmember Joe. 
Thank you so much uh, for the great presentation. I had a question about the legislative action that would mm -hmm. be needed when you change the wheeling. Mm -hmm. um, is that legislative action that would be necessary in Olympia, or is that Seattle City Council legislative action? Yes. Okay. Uh, it could be. It, well, it could be either. I. It could be as simple as just Seattle agreeing to wheel. There is some, there is some language in the existing contract on wheeling. Um, it gives that right uh, to Seattle to make the decision on whether to allow wheeling or not, partly because they, since I was over there when this came out, partly because of the fear of, oh, gee, we've got a protected Cedar River watershed and a Tolt watershed, and we don't want Lake Taps water wheeled in our system. Well, now we're talking about Tacoma water which is from protected watershed, just like Seattle's water is. Um, so the first issue could just be simply a, an agreement with Seattle to allow wheeling in their system, and you would pay for that. I mean, um, there is always a charge for wheeling. If that's not the case, then it would take legislative action that would allow wheeling, and that's happened in uh, several states, have uh, state statutes that allow wheeling in existing supply systems. And, um, we would look at something like that. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, close my questions out with a thank you to you for stepping in when our executive director, Ray, was uh, not, not available. And uh, you ably guided the organization at the time you were there. really appreciate you being here in our region and uh, CWA being able to, to tap your knowledge during that time. So thank you. Thank I you. look forward to the questions and conversation from my uh, colleagues this evening. Thank you. Is that a little bit of a dad joke, tapping <laughs> your... No? Okay. Not intended. Not intended. Okay. We're going to start Council Member Hunt, then Hall, then Martz. All right. Thank you. Um, I do have several questions. I uh, previously, but many years ago, mm -hmm. served on the Cascade Board as an alternate, so um, please bear with me with these questions. The first one is, I um, I think that at one point there was information provided about the cost, uh, the current cost structure, how the purchase of Lake Taps and the maintenance and the operations of Lake Taps in that previous decision, how that impacts the current rates. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could give us an overview of that. Yeah, I, so I'm gonna try to remember, the. I'm gonna be close um, with the numbers. Uh, we're We're paying, probably about 10 to 15 percent discount from Seattle for the water we purchase from them. Then, we're, then you all are paying a premium for Lake Taps uh, for the capital issues and the operational issues, and that puts the unit cost of water probably 15% higher than if it was, you still had the existing contracts with Seattle. I, that, I think roughly um, where it is. So what you've done is that you could argue that 15% is the insurance policy you bought or the Lake Taps policy you purchased um, for developing that as a water supply. So that's about the premium that's being paid. Okay, um, I think that would be helpful. I think that at some point there was a bar chart that showed that, and so yeah, I think um, if if that could be, uh, we will resurrect that for you. Resurrected, we'll that would be wonderful. Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so my next question is: uh, I wondered, and this might be something that you could provide um, to the board, or if it's if it's not currently available. But I wondered if we could look at the costs. It, I think that in the costs here for Tacoma. It, it uh, factors in that you're building a pipeline that would also be able to be used for lake taps. Is that, first of all, mm -hmm. let's check in with yes. that. Okay. Yes. So um, I think it would be useful uh, because lake taps is not, because as you mentioned, it's preferred that we don't have right. to develop lake mm -hmm. taps. I wondered if you could provide the costs um, without that factoring in. So mm -hmm. the costs, the, the cost to the ratepayer is not factoring in the relative difference because right now it's providing the cost um, relative to 
the, the savings relative to building out lake taps. And so if you take lake taps off the table, just for the sake of argument, I think that would be helpful to look at what are the costs of the two options. Yeah, we can give you, uh, we can break it out in three or four different ways so you can see the alternatives. We can uh, break it out so that you don't see the, the lake taps cost when you look out into future estimates. We can also break it out so you, you, you only see a central segment of cost, which is that would allow us to do wheeling through Seattle without having to build. If you look in here, you'll see there's a north segment and some other stuff. So we can give you, if you're able to tie into the Seattle system, here's what the cost would be. And then we can give you, here's what the cost would be if you um, had to do Kind of the full thing so you can see it that way you can see all those pieces and we have that information we provided some of that to the in the we did we've done i think three four to five hour sessions with member staff and with some of the board members in in excruciating detail um, and so we can provide some of that to you okay great yeah i think that would be I think that would be helpful because the Lake Taps development is not a preferred alternative. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's useful to think about futures in which we don't have that um, developed. And then, um, okay, uh, on, the, on the demand slide, um, and I recall this from my time on the Cascade Water Alliance Board as well, there was a 2006 demand projection that was, was much higher than right. it was realized. And I did see that since then our demand has been going down, but again, the projection has, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. has it making a U, a U and then going back up. And so I wondered if you could talk to mm -hmm. maybe what the uncertainty is in that. Mm -hmm. I imagine that it factors in climate change and a number of other things, but um, I wonder if you could speak to that and maybe also the the um, if there are things we we can do as a community mm -hmm. to make sure that we're not um, that we do continue what is currently a downward trend in the water demand. It's a great question. Um, well, maybe a couple pieces of information because it fits in with that. If you look at Seattle's, Seattle's provides about seventy-five or eighty percent of the water in the region um, for water supply. Um, and if you go back to ninety-two. Since 92, the population growth has been about 35 to 40% for the service area. Um, the actual use uh, has dropped 35 to 40%. So you've got population going up and you've got uh, per capita use and total, and total use down both. Um, and so when Cascade, because you'll probably find a letter floating from somewhere around that I wrote when I was at Seattle uh, criticizing the, uh, the demand estimate, but the 2006 estimate was simply pretty much going to each one of the members and saying, how much water do you think you're going to use, gathering that and then putting it on a chart. Um, and it, as you can have seen, it was a way, it was a way over an estimate. We're going through right now and updating that estimate and taking a look at what assumptions you might be able to make related to per capita use. In essence, can you continue to see a reduction in use patterns? And if you can, uh, how much, if any, does that reduce that uh, demand line? Um, because you're basing decision. <laughs> you base your decisions on what that demand line looks like. And so uh, we're taking a look at that now. So you're going to see an updated one before we ask the board for a decision um, because we want to make sure that we're basing it on the best information um, available. The biggest issue to continue to work on in the region is peak use, um, not average use. Um, because in this region, uh, peak is what drives you to build additional capacity. It's that summer use, um, which used to be roughly probably twice what, um, what average use was. Still is close to that. Um, Seattle uses about, I think their base use is about 105 million gallons a day um, on average for the year. But during the summer, when they get to peak days, it 
you know, it's between 180 and 215. Um, now, in 92, it was 326. So, huge decrease. But that peak use continues to drive the need to go out and build additional supply. Because when you look at the way Seattle calculates their ability to provide water, it's not based on the 105. It's based on the 200. Um, so every time you look at that, when you say, when you ask, do you need to provide water? Well, I need to provide water to peak if I guarantee you that you're going to get water. So the more you can do to reduce peak, the better off you are. Um, and the more water it makes it available in the region. Okay, great, thank you. Um, two more. One is um, these uh, construction projects, you know, for the Tacoma pipeline, um, several hundred million, and then the Lake Taps is uh, two mm -hmm. billion, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you can speak to the the plan for funding those, and then and also you know uncertainty around that because we did discuss uncertainty in getting the contracts, but not the uncertainty in the yeah. Funding the, for those. It's actually. Uh, you know, Seattle or Cascade has started putting money away already. Um, so they have had uh, money going into a fund over the last few years that they're starting to build a base for that uh, construction. Those costs are built into the cost estimates that we showed you, those charts, they're built in. But we have details on that that we can provide on that also. Um, the estimated costs for the pipeline was Basically, we've put in a number of inflation factors. Um, we took a look at what existing pipeline construction has been in the last year. So we actually went out and looked at existing pipelines that were under construction, looked at existing costs, and then inflated it by, I think it was 35%, to give us, to try to absorb uh, potential uh, risk issues. Um, associated with that pipeline. And there is, you know, the biggest project going on in the region is actually down in Tualatin, uh, where they are looking at getting out of the Portland system. And, and actually, for the last five years, I've been facilitating their technical experts panels on how to go through the process of looking at what those cost estimates are. So we tried to take steal some of their work and utilize that in estimating costs. And we've tried to, to be honest, overestimate costs slightly to make sure that um, I hate underestimating. So um, we have tried what we can to put enough cushion in there to, to deal with those costs. But we've got all of that information broken down in, in a lot of detail. We can provide some of that basic information to you. When we provide you the pipeline information I said earlier, you know, the, the, by segment, we can also give you some of that information. Okay, thank you. So, um, do I understand then that uh, the the ratepayers money from the ratepayers would be used to yep. fund this two billion? Yeah, unless, well, unless you can get federal grants and and do other stuff. I mean, if if you ever went back to the way it was, I ran the construction grants program for federal money back in the late seventies, um, and that was when ninety percent grants were available from the federal government. And mm -hmm. um, you know, and if we ever went back to the era where you got you could get federal or state money, we would uh, jump on that immediately. But it just doesn't. I don't see that on the horizon at this point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think this is yes. This is my last question. So on on one of the slides um, with the rates. Over time, it was one of the last slides that you showed. Um, that one, mm -hmm. yes, thank you. Um, so in this one, there is the brown line, uh, oh. which looks awfully nice. Um, <laughs> and so I'm wondering if you can talk to, is that, mm -hmm. the, is that because the reason we aren't talking more about that is because of the uncertainty in getting that contract? Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> Right now, the uncertainty of that, and I, I've talked in detail with Seattle. I mean, having been the director over there for seven years, I, I have a kind of an interest in trying to work closely with Seattle. And so I've had lots of conversations with them about the terms and conditions and their interest in having Cascade as 
continued uh, agreement with Cascade, and that um, they would agree doesn't have a high probability of availability. Um, but because they put it on the table, we have we have done the numbers on it. My I won't be around to deal with that um, as this goes forward, but in, I'm not sure that's not available in 10 or 15 years. Um, that if you take this next interim step of, let's say it is an agreement with Tacoma, uh, the water in the region's not going away, and if there is still water available from Seattle or more water available from Tacoma or from Everett, if that's the case, um, it only takes an eight-mile pipeline in the north to connect to the Everett system. You would be able to ha look at something like that in the future, assuming you got everybody in the region to agree. Um, it would the any graph would look like that because you would n not be building like taps at that point. Okay, that was it. Thank you, Councilmember Hall. You're up next. Thanks, and I also have several, so feel free to between me and I think that's my mark question too so fine if you want it um, wow 90% grants from the federal government sounds, <laughs> sounds great well, th um, think about this I tried to convince CL at the time to take those grants for the secondary treatment um, plant for sewage treatment and uh, they didn't want it because they were going to get an exclusion from secondary treatment so they and they were just going to put it into um, Puget Sound so they turned yeah. those grants down and then didn't get the exclusion from secondary treatment. So, <laughs> um, thank you very much for the detailed presentation. By the way, um, so from what I understand, the fund that you were talking about that Cascade has been putting money away for for the build out of Lake Taps, there's some flexibility in that fund, right? It's mm -hmm. a it's a capital fund that could be mm -hmm. could be used for the pipeline next yes. to Tacoma, right? It's being it's being put aside for that purpose. Okay. Um, Okay, all right, well then thank you. So stepping back out then to the, the different options, can you give us uh, any more context as to why um, the Tacoma contract seems to be so much more favorable? Um, yeah, politically, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, I would, since we're, we've done all this very publicly, um, because Seattle, in, from, I'll give you my perspective, Seattle has taken an overly conservative view on water availability and water demand um, and has decided to be exceedingly risk averse on what commitments they're willing to make. Um, and so, and I've, I've had endless conversations with them um, because I used to do be involved in all those discussions. Um, and I think they've been overly conservative. I think they could easily have done a 20 year, this is my view, they could have easily agreed to a 20 year extension, um, but that's not where they are and they're not moving and they're not budging on, on that issue. And I've talked to them since I came back in May um, about that issue. Tacoma, on the other hand, uh, if you remember, they had a large uh, paper facility uh, down in the port that. Uh, recently uh, announced its closure and they closed I think they're closing this uh, finally shutting down this month but that was about 13 million gallons a day of water that they were using 13 to 15 million gallons a day of water and all of a sudden Tacoma has significant amount of water available and we're the biggest challenge we've had uh, with Tacoma and trying to pin down how much water has not been related to how much water they have available. It's been the technical issues of how much can you move for the pipeline and uh, meet all their client, all their customer needs and still provide the water north um, to Cascade. And so they've been working, that's what they've been working through and they, they reached some agreements last week internally on how they're gonna be able to provide that water. Um, but they've been much more open since they are they have taken a, much less uh, conservative, I would argue, much less conservative view on that and are comfortable with uh, being able to provide that water. So you have Tacoma very comfortable and Seattle not. And Seattle just wasn't willing 
to make that commitment. And that's my view. No, that's very helpful context. Yeah, thanks. Um, so going with the Tacoma agreement, um, we're now connected down into that system. We're getting that much closer to that kind of regionalized mm -hmm. vision that you were describing. At that point, is it also, and I think I might have heard you say this, um, so this might just be for my own edification, but at that point, can we also, one of our options could be to push off Lake Taps even further and, and mm -hmm. potentially re-engage Seattle because mm -hmm. then they're that much closer to that fully regionalized system, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I, I think all of these, I mean, there's no way that I would say to you today, if we make this decision, this is a permanent decision through 2100. I, I mean, it would be ridiculous to say that. The uh, demand's gonna change, population's gonna change, uh, climate change is gonna have an impact. You, everybody can make an assumption over that, depending on when you get, how climate change Im impacts the region. All those things will be changing. Um, it's like the demand forecast that, um, that Council Member Hunt asked me about. The one thing I know when I do a demand forecast is it's wrong. I mean, I, there is no, unless for some reason you luck into something, it is almost impossible really to understand it. So you just do, you do kind of relative order of magnitude and you try to give yourself a risk range. Um, it's the same thing here. All you, what you're really doing is providing yourself another 15, 20, 25 years of certainty and flexibility that it, during that period, you still have options to go and look at water for extending for other, from others water in the future. You can go back to Seattle, more from Tacoma, maybe Everett. Um, maybe you decide to build like taps, but that you haven't foreclosed any of those options by making this decision. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then last question: um, You mentioned Everett before, but the only options here are Tacoma and Seattle. So I'm just curious if, if Cascade pursued Everett at, at all, or the board just the board wasn't on. interested at this point. At, and so we asked that question. The board said, not at this time. Um, and there hasn't ever really been much of a discussion anyway with Everett. That would be entirely new. So you'd be opening up something completely new. However, you know, since I'm a commissioner at Woodenville Water, um, we actually have a water right uh, that we jointly own with Everett. And the inner tie is not very far. Um, from uh, from Woodenville and from the Seattle system. So what you're really talking about is seven, eight miles of pipeline um, that would intertie that system. So over the long run, if you, you're in terms of decades, looking decadally, um, there it, are, will be options to deal with that as you look at the future. Okay, Council Member Mertz. Thanks. A um, couple of questions about programmatic risk. Um, in regards to the Tacoma system uh, as opposed to the Seattle system. Specifically, um, one, with the Tacoma system being closer to uh, that lovely mountain that you showed in the picture, uh, potential lahar and magmatic earthquake risk in the system? Yeah, th there is, uh, there's lahar risk to, to like taps um, uh, also because, you know, we're fed by the gl glaciers coming off of Mount Rainier. Um, so, all and the Cedar River system has for Seattle has some of the same issues. So you look regionally, and there are individual risks. I I really don't know the percentage or the the range of risk for each one, but each one entertains some level of environmental risk that you would end up having to deal with. Um, the, to be honest, it's one of the reasons for looking at regionalization and diversification of the system because what you really want to do is spread that risk and give yourself some protection regionally, um, uh, which is what we've argued for Interties, um, that, you know, it may be that Tacoma has a problem, but, you know, if you're intertied with Seattle, all of a sudden you have some flexibility, and we've argued in the long run we ought to have that uh, regionally. Um, but it's a great question, and ne people never ask me about Lahar, so you're the first person that's asked me about that, and it's a great question. Well, I, my employer's in the Kent Valley, oh, and yeah. so uh, okay. I've actually given presentations at work about Lahar risk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Related to that is, I guess, the same comments about intertides <laughs> would be for uh, systemic risk from a subduction fault event. Having yeah. intertides would, would keep the system more likely to be... I'm not sure... Uh, 
I would al almost put more risk on a, on surface quakes than subduction quakes. I, they tend to they tend to have a much more disruptive impact on the pipelines because the pipeline where the pipelines sit and most of them are over some, there's some fault typically all throughout Puget Sound and it I mean the Woodenville uh, utilities office sits right on top of the fault so um, you know you end up you end up dealing with those issues I'm a little bit more concerned about those and we've argued. That's one of the other reasons why it would be nice to have inner ties throughout the region, uh, because if one, you know, it's usually not from a surface quake perspective, um, it's typically not uh, the entire region that gets impacted, it's usually one. Now, having said that, um, you know, if you look at a big enough sub subduction quake at that point, it's the whole region anyway. And you're going to be out of water for, you know, your customers, 80% of your customers are going to be out of water for weeks, if not months. I mean, it's, there are horrendous risks. Um, earthquakes are horrendous risks. And it's why, um, you know, I know at Woodenville, we're spending a lot of time talking about our pipes and talking about changing the nature of the pipes we're installing to more along the lines of what Japan has done and what California uses for some of their standards to deal with the risks associated with earthquakes. It, it is significant um, for this region. And the last risk-related question I have is also because I was in the Kent Valley in 2009. Um, are all the issues around the Howard Hansen Dam fully resolved? N no. Uh, no, they're closer. Um, there are pretty much agreements in place that are close to being finalized between Tacoma, the tribes, and the federal government that will deal with, I think, the f opens up the final availability for Tacoma to get more water out of Howard Hansen. Um, you know, it's, but it continues to be an issue, as does Mud Mountain Dam, uh, where, you know, there are issues associated with Mud Mountain Dam, too. Um, so, how, so how, as we as a member of Cascade Water, Seattle's system appears less at risk of those sorts of issues? Um, it relies on a smaller number of dams that are yeah. 120 years old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've been to every one of those. Um, I'm not sure I would assign less risk to them. Uh, okay. to, seriously. I mean, I know when I was there, we had to do some major uh, improvements at the dam for the the cedar system, and and you know it had a. I won't get this right, but 1910, 1915 had a huge blowout where part of the dam was blown out and created a huge flood risk, that area is still somewhat at risk. Um, and so there's always, the Chester Morse was designed to have water, about 25 feet more water than it currently has under original design, but they've never been able to get it very high because of the inherent risk. And so I always worry uh, about those dams and the, you know, they don't generate electricity really anymore, which is what the original design was. They're owned by City Light, actually. So they have their own risks. All right. Well, f uh, thank you. I mean, yeah. that it, it makes you feel a lot worse yeah, or no, better. I mean, it, 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 in terms of the decisions that are in front of us, yeah. it makes me feel better that it isn't a, there isn't a qualitative difference in, in the risk uh, exposure level for no, the, it, the Tacoma it, system. And since you have an interest in that, if you ever want to look, look on on the web for the water supply forum and they did a huge risk analysis of the water supply systems in the region and, and its, its members are uh, kind of Snohomish County, King County and Pierce County and then they did a whole, there's a whole earthquake section in there where they looked at both the risks of subduction quakes and the risks of individual surface quakes. So all that information is in there and they, they did a, a lot of specific analytics. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your answer. Okay, we've got Council Member D. Michelle or Deputy Council President D. Michelle. Thank you. Um, so in our packets, uh, we had a, uh, a group of questions that have been raised by city staff. So maybe this is a, a question that Matt or Emily would like to field. Uh, and we had a group of, of questions that they've raised and those are all good. The last one in that list was the one that caught my attention, and the, the question is, 
what are the implications of each proposal for water quality? And so I'm wondering, uh, first of all, why was that raised as a concern? And secondly, how would we determine what we mean by water quality and, and uh, what were some of the implications that you were, that staff was wanting to explore with regard to water quality for the two proposals? Um, trying to recall. Can you repeat that one more time for me? And you can start by introducing yourself I'm, as well. I'm, I'm Matt Ellis, Utility Engineering Manager. Now, I'm just wondering why the staff raised the issue of water quality between the two proposals and what we would be looking for to uh, understand if there is a difference between um, the water quality and the two proposals. There, there's what would that, that entail? There's not really a water quality difference between Tacoma and Seattle. I mean, they're all treated clean, potable water. Um, and obviously, we have water from our wells as well that we blend currently. And so that water is treated to meet the same standards and chemical composition as Seattle water, and it would also with the Tacoma water. Um, it does, there are some changes that would need to occur, as Chuck mentioned, to the Bellevue Isqua pipeline that runs within, um, under Newport Way predominantly, and so it would change the direction of the water, the pipeline, which could potentially change some engineering mechanics of that pipe and, and how we're getting water, but from a water quality standpoint, there wouldn't be a major change. It's a great issue to raise Thanks. because when you reverse flow in any system, it raises significant questions about how well you've done the planning and how well you're you're managing the water quality because you reverse flow. You st if there's sediment and other things built up in a system, it it can elevate those and raise those. Like I said, I've been doing a lot of work down in. Uh, Oregon on that issue and it's, that's the specific issue we're dealing with is because they're reversing flow in a major system They're going to take water out of the Willamette that they never took water out of before and it's going to serve Tualatin and That whole thing has raised it does raise a whole series of water quality questions And it's the right issue to be raised and you need to go through every one of those and check the box and make sure that you've done the planning necessary to manage that if you if you're going to end up doing that it, it's a it's an important issue Um, before we go to round two, I just want to check in. Yep, Council Member Ray online. I was just going to wait until everybody was done. Um, I'm really intrigued with, with the idea of a regional uh, water supply system. Chuck, what's what do you think the probability of that happening in the next 20 years, 40 years is? Uh, I, if I go the next... I, I, the next 20 years, I'd say 50-50. Uh, the next 40 years, unless you're putting people that aren't very smart in position decision-making positions, uh, I'd say it's more 80 or 90%. I mean, I, I just think the legitimacy of a regionalized system with all the questions that have come out of, about diversification and earth and risks and other things it just makes total sense to have a system that is tied together to deal with those kinds of challenges and, and issues but it's a little harder to see that over the next 20 years it it's it takes pressure um, to be able to force some of those decisions to get made i tried and to encourage i tried to encourage that fight about 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, before I left SPU, and I, I wasn't, as you can tell, I wasn't successful at the time, so. Well, you were successful at everything else, so that's, <laughs> that's good. Um, what, um, and if we went to regional water supply, that, that would really obviate the need for, for any of these exist, the uh, contracts we're talking about or would supersede them, right? Right. Yeah, and then um, if we went to a regional water system, let's say 40 years down the road, um, what happens with Lake Taps? Is that part of the system? Is it uh, mothballed? 
What, what would you see happening there? It depends on who you talk to. Um, if you talk to Tacoma, and we've raised the question with Tacoma, they are open to having uh, Lake Taps as part of a regional system. Um, if you talk to Seattle, they're not overly interested in having Lake Taps. And in fact, Seattle is out looking at alternative sources of supply now. And I, I asked them why they didn't put Lake Taps on the list. So. Um, but they just haven't had an interest in that, at least at this point. I think in the future, we're all going to be under pressure because of climate change and dealing with the consequences of that. And that pressure is going to make uh, existing sources of supply um, a benefit for whoever owns and operates those. I think the one issue for Lake Taps, which um, will take some effort in the future politically is to is to have the Corps of Engineers operate Mud Mountain Dam slightly differently than they currently operate it so that more storage occurs there. Um, you can solve most most of the any issues related to climate change through storage um, at Mud Mountain Dam and I, I think that's an issue that will um, be an interesting discussion probably over the next five or ten years. That's great. Thank, thank, thank you. That's all I got for right now. Okay. Thank you, um, Council Member Hunt. Thank you. Um, I think this might be a question for our city staff. So we didn't discuss the wells. Um, I think because the presentation so far mostly about the whole system and the rates for overall, uh, we do currently have. 26%, it's in our packet, 26% of the city's water uh, through groundwater um, and have had 58% of the water when all four wells were in service. Right now we have three wells in service. And so I wondered if you could um, provide the, the future of the well water uh, usage and how that fits in specifically to Issaquah um, and how that would uh, potentially take the edge off some of the rates or how that would impact the rates. That is an excellent question. Um, so one of the we do need to put a centralized treatment facility in before we can turn that one well back on um, to provide better water quality. Um, that is a item that we are going to be discussing as part of our utility rate study um, that will be occurring this year. Um, so we we have we need to start planning for that project in the future. Um, so we don't have a, a clear idea of what the cost difference will be between utilizing Cascade in our, under our current uh, operating procedure versus having all the wells on with the treatment facility with the property acquisition that would require for that treatment plant. But it will be coming in the future. Okay, so I think we're at the end of council questions. So okay. at this point, we would turn to public comment. I don't think we have anyone in chambers. Do we have anyone online? Uh, council President, we do not have anyone online. Then I don't even need to ask if anybody wants to make comments. Okay, so uh, back to, I think we have a few more slides there. Thank you. We just wanted to make sure there was an understanding of a timeline. And so, uh, as you have heard, the Cascade Board anticipates they may, uh, in April timeline, begin to uh, negotiate with Seattle or Tacoma, um, pending board direction on that. And then their current timeline would be to wrap up uh, those negotiations uh, toward the end of the year and hopefully authorize a final contract by that time as well. So for this evening, uh, we were proposing that we come back, provide you a status update in late second quarter, early third quarter uh, with how things are progressing with the board. How are those discussions going? As you heard tonight, Chuck mentioned just late last week, there was a new ripple in a proposal. And so we'd like to come back to you uh, 
prior to the board uh, taking any final action, letting you know what is uh, currently under consideration and uh, how, those, how those discussions are progressing. So tonight we were hoping to get feedback on that as our next step. Also wanted to just gauge how your conversation went tonight and what additional questions you had and whether there was a need for a, another presentation in depth. Uh, so this has been very helpful for me to, to hear your questions and understand your thought process. And I think we have some follow-ups that we'll work with Cascade on. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that so far all of our questions about fears of risks and all of those things just feed into the conversation. We wouldn't be policymakers if we weren't doing that. Uh, Council Member Hunt, do you want to start with feedback? Is that I know I am happy to, but I do also have a process question clarification. Okay. Um, so for uh, so we do have Mayor Polly and Council Member Joe who are on the the board, um, but I wondered if Council will also if there would be another decision-making step that council would be involved with if we were to go with a contract um, and what that process is like. When Cascades board takes action on the contract, that is the action that authorizes the contract. So um, we're not anticipating bringing a, a question to city council, and that's why moments like this and the future check-in are going to be important to help you share your thoughts and make sure your questions get answered so that the representatives on the board can advance those. Okay, and the future check-in could be after action was taken, is that right? It, it looks like that the way it's written. It could so. be. I, I think we're still trying to ascertain whether the schedule that they have put forward is going to be the ultimate schedule. Madam Mayor Pertem. Yes, go ahead. Uh, good evening. Um, and I think you all need to tell us if that makes sense or not. I mean, there are lots of moving pieces here. Um, there may be other options that come on the table uh, through board discussion at Cascade. Um, and so I think really part of this question is how much would you like to be involved? Um, so please provide some input on that as well. Okay, you heard the administrator. So, Council Member Mertz. A few things. First off, um, I just want to mention uh, how much I love the water quality in Issaquah. I come from the Midwest, and there are many things that I love about the Midwest. The water quality is not always uh, the greatest, even, even in uh, the Twin Cities, which prides itself on having a high quality of life. So the water quality here is just uh, uh, impeccable. Um, I haven't heard anything today that doesn't make me think that we shouldn't just let the administration go find the lowest cost. I'm not hearing anything in terms of policy or programmatically or risk or, uh, you know, uh, binding us into anything that wouldn't just say, go get the best deal uh, for the resident businesses. So that would be my preference to just uh, unleash the administration and let them go forth and do what they see fit. I don't see any, I don't see any minefield here lurking where there's a, a potential outcome that would be the lowest cost but would have some other factor that would make it undesirable. Thank you. And before moving on, do you have any um, concerns or commentary on the kind of proposed schedule of coming back? No. Great. In, in terms of do I want to see more? No. That, that was my point. Like, um, Great. Yeah, Clarifying. Um, I'm going to go Council Member Hall. And uh, you guys both raised it at the same time, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much for Cascade for coming out and walking us through that. Um, there are definitely some water nerds in this council, so it's good to good to have you here. I think the process schedule looks right. I, my only caveat would be if the board suddenly starts to steer left towards um, Seattle. I, I, I think it would be good to get a touch back with council just to kind of understand what they're thinking of. Because I think for the most part, Councilmember Martz is, is right. I mean, the low-cost alternative also creates that vision of a more regionalized system or gets us, gets us closer to that. So it seems the right choice. Um, I think in our questions, there's a lot of good feedback and context for Councilmember Joe and Mayor Polly to bring back to the board as well. Um, I think whatever um, helps us put off the development of Lake Taps as long as humanly possible is the right choice. 
Um, and um, like council member um, Ray, I'm enthused by this kind of vision of a more regionalized system in, in the bar long term. So again, I agree with this and thank you very much for answering our questions. And at the moment, Tacoma seems like the right approach, but just keep us in the loop um, as definitely interested in, in kind of some harder numbers now that the, that's gone up to like 25 or 30 years, as you said. So maybe that can also be something that, that comes back. But um, as, as for another council touch, I don't think it's necessary unless they do something completely different. Great, council member Hunt. Thank you. Um, so I think that um, because we are, we heard that we we're gonna have a updated demand forecast and a lot of this does hinge on the demand as well as a um, updated as, you know, the, the current contract is currently being discussed and there was an update of Friday last week. So I don't think we have the full um, picture. So I would prefer to have that information come back to council. Um, I think there are also a number of questions that we'll have some additional information about. Um, I do also uh, understand, Council Member Joe, there's pro probably ways that you could bring back, you know, how the discussion is going um, to council in other ways in your updates. But um, my preference would be to get that information back to the full council. Uh, because it seems like it's still very much in flux and it's super important for the history or for the future of our city, what we do here. Um, uh, when we're talking about the lowest cost option, I'm, I am wondering if we're talking about the same thing because there is a brown, the brown line, which is the lowest cost option. That's also means that we have, you know, we put our, uh, we assume that there will be that long-term contract, which um, there's some there is some risk associated with that. So there's a you know how risk averse do we want to be in in assuming that we could do that? But I just wanted to flag that that long-term option, which allows us to put off, uh, which allows us to not develop lake taps. Um, is the long-term contract with SPU. And I think that that one also is closest to what we're talking about with regionalization and with, you know, when we get to a certain point 40 years in the future, we can look at Everett and these other options. So I, I think that it would be good to bring back information. Um, and I also think that it would be good to look at all of these options without factoring in lake taps, um, just separate from that conversation. Because as far as I understand, the funding that has been put aside could be used to do other things. I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but I think that that money has been put aside by the ratepayers over time and could be used to, to reduce rates or to go in on one of these contracts or other things. So um, it seems like there's a lot of options. It seems like there's more options coming on the table where options are changing. Um, and these are big costs involved and there are gonna be big costs involved to the rate pairs. Um, so for, for those reasons, I think it would be good to have this come to council. And I, um, and I think it's gonna be a, a difficult decision to make because there's a lot of variables and there's a lot of moving pieces. Thank you, Council Member Joe. Thank you. I, I like to uh, thank everyone for the conversation tonight you've given. Um, me some good guidance as I go back to the Cascade Board and Mayor Polly is going to be instrumental in that conversation as well. She will be the primary um, representative for us and we're well represented by her and, and I really appreciate her involvement. Um, looking at the Hall of Fame uh, back there, uh, Joe Forkner won the award in 2017 and David Kapler won the award in 2018. Both of those individuals were instrumental in, in uh, pushing Issaquah to think wider and uh, more in depth about our water issues. And it led to the Cascade Water Alliance agreement. And today we're thinking about kicking the can down the road a little bit in terms of deferring a major project. But we're kicking the can down the road because we have these other options and the other options are gonna open up a wealth of, of additional flexibility for us. So it's not kicking the can down the road to avoid something, it's kicking the can down the road to open up other options for us. And I think that if we think about it in that way, as we're um, working through the negotiations and uh, Mayor Polly and I are reporting back, I think this could be a very useful 
opportunity to take us to Cascade Water Alliance 2.0, if you will. And um, I look forward to the conversation with the board, the Cascade board as well, and um, I'll report back as, as we go forward. But please uh, reach out to me or to Mayor Polly uh, with any questions as we go forward. And if we do need to have uh, Cascade back for a presentation, I think they're more than willing to do that. Um, if we need them for um, other uh, questions that might uh, be necessary along the way, I, I think they're, um, that's an option as well for uh, the future. So um, really appreciate the conversation and guidance tonight. Thank you. Great. And I see Council Member Ray online with a hand. Thank you. Um, wow, this is a really complex decision to make. And as I, I listened to everything, I'm struck by, um, and I think this is, I'm really aligned with uh, Council Member Hunt, that there's a lot of moving parts here. And there's the, um, you know, the financial considerations, um, there is the environmental risk, there is the disaster risk, there is a political risk, there's the uncertainty of what the future is going to hold. Um, there's some technical risk. I, I love that we got to use the word wheeling tonight. And um, and then there's at the bottom of it, there's the rate impact. So there's there's a lot of things to think about. And so um, I don't know that we could say today, yeah, this is the right decision because I, I, could, I couldn't process everything that Chuck put on the table today. And I'd seen some of it before. So I'm kind of hoping that we can get some updates um, at a minimum from Mayor Polly and Council Member Joe as this thing progresses and as more information becomes available. And, you know, I ask you as our representatives on the board to be the conduit and bring that information back. Um, and then I just want to end with, um, you know, something that I think is really true, which is water is the most important resource of the 21st century. It is the oil of um, of this of this era so making sure that we have enough water and that we manage it effectively is probably one of the most important things that we're going to do in our lifetime so thank you thank you uh deputy council president d michelle uh thanks um so uh i will repeat a, a, a quite a bit of what's already been said but just uh to think about water as a, a basic human need. And uh, if it costs a lot, that has really uh, big implications for uh, our future going forward. So um, I definitely think that looking at what, how we can keep down the costs is, is really, really important. Um, I really appreciate your presentation tonight. I am not a water nerd. So uh, listening to your explanation made a lot of it clearer to me and I, I appreciate that. But the one thing that I heard that uh, I liked a lot was that uh, we are in a process here. Uh, we're not going to make a final decision tonight. We're going forward. There are, as Councilmember Joe said, there are uh, options opening up to us as we go down this path. And so uh, I tend to think that you made uh, you made a good case for the Tacoma, uh, but we're going to learn more. And to Councilmember Hunt's uh, uh, statement uh, as more information comes in we have the option of of modifying our position so uh, I really appreciate what was done and I do hope that we get more information uh, as we uh, head towards this decision but uh, thank you so much again for a, a really uh, informative presentation thanks and I will just say I've had the pleasure of uh hearing everyone before I talk, and so I don't have anything to add. All of the questions have been asked, all of the concerns, the issues. Um, it looks like we're going to have a good set of conversations and honestly, some good options ahead of us. And so I look forward to hearing what staff says and what our representatives on the board say as, we, uh, as the negotiations happen. Uh, Member Hall. Sorry, and I know this one has gone on for longer than we had planned, but I don't, I don't think it's clear to me what the next steps are. So, so as the recommendation was to have Cascade and staff come back one more time, either Q2 or Q3, for updates, but was the idea from your comments to have another meeting in addition to that? Yeah. 
Um, well, and I, I will just speak for myself. I think that it would be good to have um, another touch with the full council before the decision. So if that's you too, then I, you know, if that, if that works out, then I think that we don't need to have another urgent one right now. Um, but I, I do think that's the hinging point for me is that it would be good to have the answers to the questions that have been raised tonight and to, to have a better, once the options have crystallized more and we've separated out some of the different options a little bit better, um, I think that that would be good to have that information come back to council. But I am one of seven, so that's my, that's my part. City Administrator. You know, my sense from the discussion is the council wants to be kept apprised. Uh, you have two very talented, experienced uh, uh, members uh, on the Cascade Board. Uh, so I think uh, from Councilmember Joe's comments that that's been heard loud and clear tonight. And I'm sure Mayor Polly, um, who I think you all know is in Tokyo uh, this evening um, as part of a, a delegation of local government officials from the United States and Canada uh, there for this week, uh, she will watch this. It's, it's the middle of the day in Tokyo. Otherwise, I would think she might actually be watching it live. Uh, but but she will absolutely watch this. And I think uh, based on the discussions, uh, she, Councilmember Joe, will keep council leadership and apprised, and if it's appropriate, come back. At whatever point it's appropriate to come back, we will. That answer your questions about next steps? Kind of, yeah, I guess. Because so then so it's full steam ahead with the discussions we are one agency of many seven right. in cascade so those discussions will continue um council member joe mayor Pauly will continue to be part of those we will keep the council prized uh off agenda uh, i'm sure as as things progress and if there is a policy point that the mayor and council member joe feels appropriate to bring back we'll let council leadership know and we'll come back so but i think this is saying certainly by late uh, second quarter, early third quarter, regardless, you'll likely see us back talking. If there is a point that makes sense, and Councilmember Joe, the mayor, I believe it's appropriate, then we will come back to it. Okay. A little bit of flexibility, and by recognizing that we do want another touch. Yeah, or just call Councilmember Joe. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Show up on his doorstep. It's cool. We'll just talk about those things. Okay. Um, does the administration have what they need? We do, thank you. Excellent, thank you to the Cascade Water Alliance folks who have come down and good luck on your other presentations, all the other cities. Um, looking ahead, we've got two more items. You want a five minute break? Mm -hmm. Sounds good, we've got two more items. We'll get a five minute break while you're setting up and we will come back at 8.08.
I'll wait for the on-air light. Okay, we are back from our five minute break on to item two of three, which is ID 1655, the city work plan presented by Dale Markey Cripp, assistant to the city administrator. Dale. Good evening, everyone. Dale Markey Crimp, assistant to the city administrator. And I'm here tonight to share with you an update on our city work plan. So the, the administration has been providing quarterly updates on the city work plan now for a handful of years. Um, the presentation tonight is providing an informational update from our previous presentation, which was in late October 2023. So all of the work that's been done since then um, and since through the first month of 2024. Tonight, we're specifically seeking questions and any input that you might have on the city work plan for 2024. This is the second half of the 2023-2024 work plan. Uh, the recommendation tonight is to receive this work plan and to ask questions um, and, and also to provide some input on how you'd like to engage with work plan updates throughout the rest of this year. Do we want to keep the process that we've had in 2023 or is there something different you would like for 2024? A little bit of background for the public. Um, the city work plan is designed in alignment with our citywide strategic plan and with the budget. So most recently our 2024-2025 biennial budget. The administration developed this current work plan back in early 2023, the end of 2022, um, and has provided regular updates quarterly uh, on the progress that was made throughout 2023. And as I mentioned with the most recent one in late October, 2023. This information was provided in the memo, but I wanted to provide a, a visual here of the progress since the most recent. And actually you can see all the way back here in this table to the May update, uh, the status on the items in the work plan. So since October, uh, we've seen actually a slight decline in the number of items that are on track, but that's good news because they're all items that went from being on track to being complete. Um, a decline in the number of actions, again, with minor challenges. These, again, also went mostly from minor challenges to complete, which was exciting to see. Um, one um, ongoing major challenge, though we'll talk a little bit about um, how it shows up as a minor challenge in the document itself, but I'll talk about why. Uh, that's a typo, but I'll also talk about um, why we should be excited because we have seen some, some notable progress on that item. So it was a major challenge um, and it is less of a major challenge now. We still have no actions that are on hold um, and we've seen uh, eight additional items move to complete from the October update. So there were 10 complete eight additional, and as was noted in the memo, uh, we removed the 10 that were complete last time from the work plan. So we can narrow down, let's focus on what we're still working on, let's see what we're still working on. Um, so 18 total completed items over so far over the biennium. There are a lot of places we could dive in. I'm gonna provide, in the spirit of our strategic plan, a little bit of an update by strategic plan goal area. So we'll start with mobility. Um, we've had four completed mobility actions uh, over the, the year and a couple months now. One of those is new to this particular update. So we saw um, specifically uh, a lot of things were moved on these from the, uh, from the update this time around. Some notable items. Uh, you all saw me in late October talking about the ADA transition plan. Um, getting that off the shelf is a really exciting opportunity. For growth and development, we have five completed actions. Um, only one of these was new to this current update. The other four um, were all complete as of the October update. All the other items in growth and development are on track except for the completed design manual for Old Town, um, which has been included in the Title 18 future updates list. Uh, it needs a more comprehensive plan for community engagement before we would consider that to be on track. Next, we have environmental stewardship. Uh, most actions in this category remain on track. 
I, I, I feel as though you received a report about Green Issaquah. We had some of the highest numbers of volunteers and hours of volunteering this past year. Um, also, our sustainable purchasing policy uh, has been um, administratively adopted. Things change between the packet and when I get to be in front of you. So that's an exciting thing to see move forward. Um, the park plan system update is still on track for council engagement this year. Um, and the one place where we're seeing challenges is around electric vehicle fleet transition. Specifically, some challenges we've been continuing to see in acquiring vehicles. Um, that's continued on into um, throughout all of 2023. I know that started prior to that. For social and economic vitality, again, most items remain on track. And we are lucky to have um, Jen Davis Hayes in the building tonight, who can share a little bit more if there are questions. We've had six completed items in this, or actions in this category. Only one that's new for this update, the remaining five were in the previous update. Other actions are on track with the exception of the wayfinding. Um, again, due to staff capacity, there's, there was a, some delays in moving that project forward. The current um, estimated implementation though is going to be for Q2 of 2024, now that we do have the staff capacity to move that work forward. And last but certainly, um, not last, excuse me, second to last and certainly not least, uh, city leadership and services. So six completed actions in this uh, category. Um, all of these, not all of these are new. Only one of these is new. I skipped ahead, y'all. I'm gonna go back to this one. Um, no one even blinked at me, but I totally blinked at myself here. Um, so social economic vitality, most actions are on track. The last one down at the bottom, um, finding spaces for nonprofits. That has been the, one of the greatest challenges. There's a, there's a really significant goal in the work plan around more opportunities, more capacity for community groups and nonprofits. The real challenge is space um, and finding space that they can, they can be in that fits their need. Um, as a way to be able to provide more immediate services here in the community. I already talked about this one, but I'll talk about it again now that we're back on it. So city leadership and services, six complete actions. Five of those six were in the October update. Um, the, the key one in this update is that the public engagement toolkit is not just finalized. It went to the equity board. It also was presented to council. Um, it's now in use. Um, and so we consider that to be um, complete at this point, and we'll continue to gather input on its effectiveness over the course of the upcoming year as we use it. And then infrastructure. So we have three items um, that were completed, three action items completed. Most other items in here remain on track. Um, the exception uh, in here we've got, um, again, is fleet. Uh, we finished our fleet study in late 2022. Um, the, there are a lot of items that were already uh, being implemented administratively, sort of improvements to internal processes, but in terms of a policy decision, um, staff is still working on deciding what they want, exactly what they'd like to bring to council for presentation, and we expect that to happen um, ahead of the upcoming budget conversations. Um, and so you can expect that coming up soon. So just some timing and next steps, and then we'll, we'll move to questions. We're gonna continue to move forward with items on the work plan um, and report out on updates. The current plan is to update quarterly, but as you know, um, requests for ad hoc updates on particular items uh, is something that we'll also engage in throughout the upcoming uh, year. The next planned um, update will be following the end of quarter one, so hopefully early in quarter two. Um, aiming for April, followed by subsequent quarterly updates uh, in July and October. Again, the, the hope for tonight um, was to provide a bit of an update to you on everything that's happened since October um, in terms of our progress on the work plan, but also to have an opportunity for questions. Uh, we have department directors um, on, on the virtual line and in the room tonight to answer any additional questions you might have, and then also to get input on how would you like to engage with this in an ongoing way? Did the way that, it, the way that we brought information to you last year work well? Uh, would you like to see something slightly different here in 2024? Um, and so with that, I'll leave this up. Questions, starting with Council Member Mertz. 
Two questions. Sorry, which was the one action that had major challenges? Yes, the um, in the mobility section, uh, it is, one second, I am pulling it up myself, the transportation concurrency policy and level of service. Um, it had been marked as major challenges and then had been, there was a typo, it, it looks like it says minor challenges. Um, in talking today with John Mortensen, uh, he shared with me that the, one of the major, the, one of the holdups for major challenges, and I'm sure Director Emily Moon might have more to share, was simply around staffing capacity to get the consultant brought on to move the work forward. Um, before Gene Paul um, left the city, he was able to add that capacity to the public works team. And so we are very close to executing a contract with that consultant. John told me this week, hopefully, um, which will move that closer to being, it will not, it's not on track in terms of the original timeline, but it is no further off track than it was um, at the October update was, he did, a, he did a really great engineering thing where he cited the definition for minor challenges versus major challenges. And he said, well, minor challenges says, since the last update, it has not moved further away from being only a quarter behind its original goal. And I said, okay, I uh, accepted. Um, but that, that was the item that was off track. It's still slightly behind, but we're getting closer to being back on track there. So the negative float hasn't gone more negative. Exactly. I see. Okay. Yep. Um, the second question I have is uh, electric vehicle fleet transition. Tra challenges in acquiring vehicles due to supply chain delays and competing demand. What does that mean? I think we should phone a friend. Uh, Otto Monahan, our director of community services, is, or uh, administrative services is online. Bring her over here. Um, Autumn, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about the procurement issues that we've been facing? Sure. Um, so, you know, we have been successful in getting a few electric vehicles um, and are eyeing other options as we are turning over our fleet for what we can acquire for electric vehicles. We were also successful in uh, acquiring five hybrid patrol vehicles, which will be in our fleet soon. Um, finding additional vehicles, especially patrol vehicles that are even hybrids, um, is extremely difficult. And in talking with all of our other partners, in other agencies throughout the state and throughout the country, um, there just isn't the supply from, um, from a lot of our major vendors. So we're still working on it and looking at, uh, again, how we can diversify our fleet in other ways um, outside of police patrol. And so we're continuing to do that with our customers internally. Okay, I was just curious because it seems like the <laughs> internet keeps saying that nobody's buying electric vehicles anymore. I think it's possible that oh. the internet maybe Incorrect on this. Hard though that may be to believe. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Autumn. Um, questions, uh, Deputy Council President De Michelle, then Councilmember Hunt, Hull, and Joe. Um, so I was really happy to see that the <coughs> excuse me, the transit oriented development is now reset to be back on track and it has an end date of December twenty-five. Um, could you give us a little bit more detail about that? Because I, I'm pleased to see that. Is that realistic, I guess, is the question. Andrea Schneider, our Deputy City Administrator, continues to work on the TOD project and would ask that uh, she provide an update. Good evening, council members. Uh, TOD project update is that we are still uh, in the process of trying to um, relocate the, the cell tower that is on the future TOD site and build that cell tower at the Tibbetts Valley Park. So that's what has to happen first before um, we can finish or we can even begin um, to build the actual TOD OC. Um, meanwhile, King County Housing Authority has been working on hiring a new architect and design firm for the TODOC project. Um, so they should have that firm selected uh, sometime this month. And then, um, then they can start with that design process, including working with the city's uh, future tenants in the Opportunity Center. Thank you. And my other question was, um, 
about the light rail visioning. I see that we are already advertising for citizens to participate in, in that process. And it looks like we're going to get a report on that in the fourth quarter. Um, so would you just like to talk a little bit about the steps to that and um, where are we going with that light rail visioning? I just think that I was, I'm really excited to see that this is happening, but does anybody want to add to that in, uh, with a little bit more detail? I think Andrea. Sure, hi. Um, yes, uh, we have, um, we will begin more of an outreach process uh, for that light rail station area visioning. Um, and so more of that work is in store for us this year. I don't know what specific um, details you're looking for. I think at a future date, we can talk about um, the specifics of our engagement plan. We can provide more information on what that might look like. Um, yeah. But it, yeah, I'm sorry, Andrea. I think my question was more specifically, um, we're going to have this public engagement. How are we going to, how's the council going to um, participate in that? And what will be the interaction between those groups and and the council. Yeah, Councilmember D. Michelle, I would love to get you more, or I'm sorry, Deputy Council President D. Michelle, <laughs> I would love to give you more um, detailed information on that. And I'd prefer to just uh, follow up in an email to council if that's all right. Yeah. Um, I know that we'll be certainly keeping uh, the Mobility and Infrastructure Committee, um, uh, you know, up to date and a part of the process, but I'm lacking specific details on timelines and exactly what that public engagement plan looks like. So um, I'd love to get back to you over an email to you and the rest of council. All right, thank you very much. Okay, next I think is council member Hunt, then Hall. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. There was, a, you updated us on the transportation concurrency policy and level of service. Um, I thought that maybe the transportation concurrency model update, which also has minor challenges, was related, but then I was reading it and then I thought maybe it wasn't. So I wondered if you could uh, clarify if there was additional challenges to be worked through on that or if they are just related and they're sort of the same issue. I'm gonna invite Director Moon up. Yes, you are correct. They are two different somewhat related projects. The data update was slightly delayed uh, for a couple of reasons. One was we had to wait to some degree for uh, some actions under Title 18 to be known so that we could plug in land use uh, probabilities into the model. Uh, second reason is our consultant found an error late in the process in the data entry and needed to go back and make that correction. But um, we're expecting that data any day and uh, we're going to be bringing that uh, forward to council to share uh, what we've learned from it and couple that um, in close fashion with the discussion on any policy questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, on to council member Hall. Um, thank you. So um, I only bring this up because I was on the capital finance community task force. So I'm just wondering if there's any value in that first one. Um, you know, we were able to pass the transportation benefit district sales back. That is a huge success for that. Is there any value in keeping that on track because there were kind of more elements of our long term capital funding strategy um, kind of worked up in those recommendations and and also questions that the task force didn't consider, like those with regard to facilities that um, kind of remain kind of still an open question. I just wanted to ask the administration if maybe there's value in keeping that keeping that one alive, the M O one C. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, I think most likely, you know, I, as has been previewed to this group. Uh, we're looking ahead at a strategic plan update this coming year, and one of the parts of that will be exploring the objectives and the actions aligned to that objective. Um, and so it seems like a great opportunity also to look at the specific actions aligned to MO, I believe it's 
MO1C mm -hmm. uh, and see if it's time to redefine now what, what do we mean by MO1C in 2024? That is a perfect segue into my follow-up question, which is as the strategic plan gets updated, are we expecting that um, all the objectives and all the actions will, will be different in the, the work plan that gets presented to us year over year? I think that is potentially something that could happen as a result of that engagement. Okay. Uh, it won't change the actions on this year's work plan, but as we look ahead to 20, the 2025-2026 biennial budget, absolutely. Thanks. Council Member Joe. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the Wildland Fire Protection Initiative. It's toward the end of the uh, report. Thank you for all the great detail you have in this report. It uh, certainly gives us uh, things to think about and directions that we can uh, look for improvement. Um, is this uh, initiative uh, solely Eastside Fire and Rescue, or does our city have uh, some role in it? And if so, what? I'm going to ask uh, Autumn to come back on. Um, you know, our emergency manager, Jerry Schneider, has been working very closely with the Eastside Fire and Rescue on this. Uh, they've had some staffing challenges themselves at EFER on this point. Um, I'll let Autumn pick up the story from there. Uh, but, but certainly we're committed. This is a, a regional issue, and uh, we have a piece of it as well as EFER, as well as some of our other neighbors. Uh, Autumn, do you want to add? Uh, yeah, well put, Administrator Bobkowitz. Um, so Jared, our emergency manager, has a lot of experience uh, in this area and worked um, mostly on the King County's initiative around wildfire and so has a lot of experience in it. Um, we are happy that EFER is now fully staffed in their emergency management team, and so we're excited to get going on that work and in that partnership. Um, a lot of that will include some community engagement, as well as a lot of training and, and plan writing. So um, we're excited to roll up our sleeves and get going on that work with, with Eastside Fire and Rescue this year. Great. Thank you for that background. I appreciate it. Um, there's an engrossed Senate bill down the legislature right now. It's 6120-6120. That's addressing the wildland urban interface maps. And uh, I think that if it does pass, there will be a larger role or a greater role the city could play in uh, helping define the areas of the wildland interface for us uh, that makes sense for our particular topography and our environmental situation. I would uh, encourage the administration to watch to see if this passes. And then if it does, um, try to take advantage of the options that are available for us uh, for the wildland urban interface. Thank you. Okay, now we're going over to Councilmember Martz. Um, if we could talk a little bit about the TOD again, um, maybe Deputy City Administrator. Uh, what's the issue with the cell tower moving? When last, when last we talked, I thought we found it a nice, happy home uh, where it would uh, thrive and play with... Uh, we found it a home. What, what's happened since then? That is uh, still the home, Tibbet Valley Park. That's still the plan. Um, we're in permitting right now. And so um, we are uh, at towards the end of the permitting process. Um, this project, I think, was just a little tricky. We wanted, there's a water main uh, very close to the site. There's, um, uh, you know, critical areas that are close and adjacent to the site. So we wanted to make sure that access was maintained for water main and all kinds of stuff. So, um, and the design um, of, the, of the cell tower and accompanying building um, isn't obtrusive to the park. And so um, we've been going through the permitting process. Um, and I think the, uh, the, the cell tower company has just um, resubmitted their permit um, and responded to the, the comments the city staff have provided. So we're getting very close. Uh, to the cell tower being permitted, but it's not quite yet permitted. Okay. And then the second part of this is, you know, hearing, uh, sounds like there's exciting new things from the uh, King County Housing. And I guess I would ask, it sounds like maybe it's time for us to get an update um, from and invite those fine folks back to hear how the plans are looking and uh, how they're going to get to December 2025 and maybe even have it come before services and safety and parks. 
to, uh, to hear from them because it's been quite some time. Yes, I think um, an update at some point this year would be appropriate. Uh, this at this point in time, not much has changed because they're still getting that new architecture firm on board. So um, they they'll need some time to put some plans together. Um, also, this year, uh, we look forward to signing a condominium agreement with King County Housing Authority. Um, that is something that we have planned to do by the end of the year. Uh, that condominium agreement. As you may recall, would um, govern our ownership of the opportunity center space. So those conversations will be happening, and we will certainly be bringing those items uh, to city council and, of course, the, the appropriate city council committees. Okay, sometime this year, when on something that is ostensibly going to be done by next December, seems like a very wide range. Indeed. I would hope it'd be sooner rather than later. I, I would. It's just been a long time since we've heard from them, and it's exciting to hear that they're on track uh, for December of 2025, but I, I'm excited to hear more. So I'm hoping that it will be not towards the end of the year, but uh, sooner, right? Because if there were any questions or whatnot, end of the year, only 12 months before the whole project is due, and given that we're, what, six years in at this point, uh, that seems like it seems like sooner is better than later. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Okay, looking over my questions, it's more about things that I'm not seeing on there. Um, and so I know work plans based on strategic plan, but there's also some other um, items on there. So I'm wondering if we can get um, an update on when the online business and occupation tax um, payments will be available. I know we've rolled out utility billing um, online, so looking forward to hearing about when that's coming. Um, I know um, earlier Matt Ellis mentioned the utility rate study. I don't see that kind of on this list, and so understanding when that is coming would be useful. Um, the other thing that I don't see on here is our city hall and facilities kind of further decisioning. Um, feels like that's gonna be a big thing for the year. So it would be nice to have an understanding of how that um, comes through as far as when it's coming to council and what the big decision points are. And then I recognize that we are probably one year into Title 18 being launched, or at some point we will be. And so I know there was a commitment to coming back to us and saying, hey, here's how the rollout has gone with any developers or developments. Um, so I'd like to see if we can get that back in as well as the project approval flow charts. And I just realized I'm providing feedback rather than questions which is really not helpful as a facilitator. We'll take it. Okay, fantastic. Sorry guys, just go into my notes and I thought they were all questions, but not really. Um, okay, I assume there is no one online for questions. There's all sorts of people online. What would you like to talk about? No, I meant public comment oh. questions. Okay. And Chris, I'm going to come back to you, see if I'm glad your technology is now stabilized. Do you have any questions on the city work plan item? No, I don't, but I want you to know that uh, my uh, computer took advantage of uh, failing to also reinstall new software. So Ooh. it got to be a protracted. No, no questions. Thank you, though. Okay. Um, Council Member Hunt. Uh, thank you. Well, actually, your your question or your comments did um, make a, a question come to my mind, which is, uh, I also I also think there are some things that the city is working on over this next year that aren't in this work plan. I was looking for habitat restoration and salmon, uh, and um, and so I I uh, wondered if you could briefly describe what. Um, what gets onto the work plan uh, that we see versus um, versus I know there there are additional things going on. Um, well, the, the work plan's not meant to be every single thing we right. do as the city of Issaquah. Yes. Um, what we've tried to do is take 
of the uh, objectives of the strategic plan and incorporate those with updates. And then what the administration feels are key projects, something that goes above and beyond the everyday. So uh, we want to be sensitive to the council uh, if there are specific projects that might even be considered every day but are of particular importance or of interest to the council. Um, you know, we're just trying to make sure that this is not a 100-page document. Um, we want it to be meaningful to you. We want it to be meaningful to the community. So if there are things, or you can just ask the question. I mean, we have the entire senior management team online. Mr. Watling is here, and I'm sure we'd be happy to talk a little bit about some of the habitat work that we're doing. So and that also leads to the, the final question is to what format. We have given you written updates, I think, the last two years. Haven't gotten a lot of feedback on those. If you find this kind of round robin conversation helpful, we're happy to do it. It just takes time and resources to have everybody join us. But as I think you've seen, it's a pretty easy thing to bring people in electronically. So, as a note, there, um, council leadership had it, previous years. Um, this has been kind of a tag on in our retreat. And so usually because we have such meaty topics of the retreat, we don't get a lot of questions here. So we asked the administration and city council leadership to bring it a committee of the whole so that we could ask questions. So one of the questions then is, does that make sense? Do written updates in the remainder of the year work? How, how do you want to interface with this going forward? I was going to say, no, really, that's a question. Uh, Council Member Joe. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate the uh, written reports that you've been giving us. Uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, putting them on the consent agenda uh, for us to review is fine. If any of us have any questions about a particular topic, we should try to get those questions to the administration um, by noon on Monday at the very latest um, so that you can have someone join us. Uh, by video or be here and answer the questions. But I think that we as council members need to take a little bit of the onus and the responsibility of reading this and, and giving the administration a little bit of heads up in terms of what questions we want to ask. So I think the timing of the reports is great, but I think that um, you could put a little more of the responsibility on the council to um, get their questions in order before the meeting. Council Member Hunt. Um, I, I think this is uh, is helpful in, in the written form. Um, I think it's also over time gotten, um, it has a lot more information now about how things change over time, which was one of the, the things that I um, had asked for previously. So I really appreciate that. Now, when you go and look at the narrative, it does, it does say, you know, this, this was because uh, as things get back to being on track, then they come back on track, but it may not have been the original track. And so now it does, I think it's helpful for us as policymakers to know that it is now on track, but it's on a different track than it was originally, and that has changed by a year or however much it's changed. Um, so I think that that's really helpful, and I think um, that's that's been a big improvement, at least for for me, in terms of um, how I I can use this to sort of see how things change over time. Um, and uh, as far as how we want to work with it. I mean, I think it is a good, I think it is a, a helpful document, and I think it is on us to ask about things we don't see on here, and then, um, and potentially council leadership to, to flag things that are, that are potentially important to us as policymakers, but not on here. But I think the, um, I think overall it's a helpful document for us to be reviewing, and uh, I think the presentation is good. So I think what I've heard maybe is we're okay with written reports on consent going forward for the remainder of the year. Is there any objection to beginning of the year having an kind of in-person presentation? Okay. That's what this is. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying going forward into future years with the expectation that the others could be um, written on consent. Any other feedback, questions? Yep, go ahead. Um, I, have, I have one more thing, which is, um, is I think especially for the, the, one, the one where we have the presentation towards the beginning of the year, it would be good to make sure that large 
large projects um, are on here so that council can track them. I'm thinking of ARPA, the ARPA funding that's being used um, in the, the pedestrian park and the um, in front of the senior center for those improvements. I could be missing it, but I searched just now for, for uh, pedestrian. I couldn't find it under that heading anyway. Um, so I think just those large dollar amount uh, big projects, even if they are, yeah, I think those would be good because it's good for council to know where those are in the process and also for the community to know. And there is a capital report that's separate to them. We were not asked to bring that this evening. Okay. Have what you need? I do. Thank you. Thank you to all the senior leadership staff in person and online. Appreciate seeing your names on the screen and those who appeared in person um, or on camera. Okay, looking at our next, we've got another item, which is ID 1641, a regional coalition for housing arch strategic plan presented. Oh, Wally Bobquist, city administrator, is going to start us off on that. I am indeed. Um... Let me just let the police chief know she is good to go. Uh, Madam Mayor, pro tem members of the council, uh, as I think you know, I am the city's representative on the ARCH board. I serve as the uh, Mayor Polly's uh, uh, proxy uh, on the board on a regular basis. Um, in recent weeks, recent months, the board has uh, conducted a strategic strategic planning process uh, to kind of take a look at itself as a board, as an organization, and uh, be thoughtful about the future. Uh, there is now a draft strategic plan that uh, the board has reviewed. Um, it is now uh, out for comment. Um, each mem board member was uh, asked to take it back to their jurisdiction and receive whatever comment they felt appropriate based on you know the, how their jurisdiction does business and of course every city operates a little bit differently um, in my participation in the strategic planning process I have had some serious concerns about uh, the future of arch the role of elected officials the role of appointed officials um, the role of, uh, of advocacy and there are several points within the strategic plan that address that um, so I'm, I'm here this evening uh, with Jen Davis Hayes' help and, and Lindsay Masters, the executive director of ARCH, is also with us um, to have you get an overview of the entire document because certainly there are many other pieces to it uh, that focus on the important work that ARCH does. Uh, but there are a few points that I have been concerned about that I have raised uh, concern as the Issaquah's representative. Uh, and as the strategic plan now goes into its final stages, uh, I want to be clear on the council's uh, viewpoint. I have discussed this with Mayor Polly. Um, she too is curious to hear uh, the feedback from the council. Um, some of the issues that have been raised have not been widely raised by our other neighbor jurisdictions. Um, and so uh, I, I think we're at a critical point now uh, to understand what is really important to Isqua, what should be advocated, and what is, you know, perhaps just as we all, you all serve on various regional bodies when you're one of many, um, you have an opinion and you're entitled to that opinion, but perhaps the rest of the group does not share that opinion. So hopefully tonight, looking to get some feedback from you on some of these points. So I've asked Jen uh, to come tonight to give a very broad overview of the entire document, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. And I also appreciate Lindsay uh, for joining us this evening so she can provide uh, more of an institutional point of view on any points that you may raise. And thank you, and good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Wally. I appreciate that uh, introduction. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Jen Davis Hayes, Economic Development Manager, and I'm here to present uh, the high level of the strategic plan. And we are very thankful to have um, our phone a friend here in Lindsay <laughs> Masters, who is obviously very inter, uh, inter intricately involved in this process over the past year and a half. Plus. So again, we're here tonight to uh, get any feedback and just kind of inform you about the strategic plan. Um, there are four areas that we'll be talking about here about the about 
uh, the ARCHES plan. And while there is no budget ask for any implementation for this year, there may be, it's a may be, uh, in our next biennium. So we wanted to make you aware of that as, again, we're looking at things because, of course, it'd be great if we can do everything under the current budget, but I want you to be aware of it makes sense. So, the again, the strategic plan process for ARCH, uh, they started out um, establishing goals in uh, 2022. They had an organizational assessment, um, and they then selected a consultant in February 23. And then um, really looked at um, setting a goal of how to build more affordable housing faster, right? That sounds great. Um, and so it's a high-level direction uh, that ARCH staff will implement, implement over time. So the board has created this strategic plan, um, and uh, they're hoping that the refined and strengthened ARCH identity helps uh, kind of move their organization forward um, in a more effective way. So I know that council members um, Walsh, Hall, and Dee Michelle participated in online survey as part of the engagement, so thank you very much for that. And then the strategic plan was brought to the board for review in January and February. Um, so this is, again, just coming hot off the presses. So for the first theme is governance and administration. And so this is really looking at, you know, cores, uh, the, uh, ARCH's core functions. So making sure that they address the issues in affordable housing, leverage uh, opportunities, and allocate resources effectively. Um, they are the experts in the region on affordable housing. A lot of cities don't have any staff that work on affordable housing. Um, we are lucky we do have a few, but, um, and their, their role is also to um, manage and preserve affordable, the affordable housing that exists. So making sure the people that are living in there continue to be um, meeting the guidelines, et cetera. So the governance administration part really is about streamlining decision-making, um, empowering the coalition to tackle major policy challenges, right? So making sure that they're a strong organization so that they can achieve great things. So for instance, they are talking about um, doing more engagement with elected officials like yourself to educate, inform about what's going on, and to really help uh, councils and other elected officials across the area be uh, more aware of what's needed to, to move that for, uh, affordable housing forward. They are also looking at, does it make sense for elected officials to be more involved in the governance of their organization? Um, they, they have identified some ways to streamline operations as they continue to grow as an organization. Of course, as they're looking at, as every organization is, where are the efficiencies and where do we make sure that we're addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the way we do our, our work. The uh, policy, legislative, and funding area is really focused on state and regional policy efforts to increase uh, funding and reduce barriers overall. So looking at are there targeted state and, and um, regional legislation that they can create um, uh, information for and go and advocate for funding that supports to build more, to build more uh, housing faster. Um, they want to continue to serve as a policy resource um, so making sure that uh, the information that about these the funding barriers, et cetera, that information is available to all of their members. And then they also want to make sure that they support the legislative advocacy that each of our cities uh, may be doing so that we at least have the information um, from another perspective. Sorry, I did not move forward like I thought. <laughs> uh, one moment. I think we've got a yes. question, Deputy Council President. Yeah, Michelle. So just to dig a little deeper on the governance change analysis, and so I, I know that the that Arch has a um, advisory group, and then you've also got a board. Um, and so are we talking and looking at how those two interact and seeing if if that's an efficient uh, decision making model, or um, are there other specific things that you want to do when you're thinking about? Um, making the decision-making process more efficient. Um, that could be an example of something that we include in that study. Um, there were a number of topics that came up in the board's process this year that we identified we definitely wanted to take a look at and study, and one of those was um, the role of elected officials and how they're engaged in ARCH. Um, the community advisory board was something that got a little bit less attention from, from the board, but I think ARCH staff are interested and um, 
not necessarily changing the scope and function, but looking at ways to improve the efficacy of the group. So we're we're able to continue, you know, continue to pursue some of those um, under the current interlocal agreement, and wouldn't necessarily need to have it as part of a consultant study. But um, I think it's 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 something the board would have to scope this year and decide what's the range of things they want to include in the study. Thank you. Great. And I'll get on the right uh, slide. So looking at the local policy and planning, um, so this is uh, their effort to d dedicate new capacity to support the important local policy priorities. So they're going to evaluate, they get a lot of requests. I know that because I know that I've asked them for a lot of help with what we've been doing. Um, but to um, they get a lot of requests using um, uh, from, from different uh, members. And so they want to think more about, be strategic about those requests. How can they screen them? How can they uh, add capacity if there's a need to, if cities are all looking to have a housing analysis, looking at um, a certain aspect of housing. Um, and then they really uh, think there's a, an opportunity to think about surplus land and other strategies of how, again, to address getting more affordable housing. So that may be looking at feasibility studies, at development, at zoning and incentive strategies. And so really, again, shifting a little bit of that focus um, of their capacity to do more of that to get how affordable housing built faster. And then um, program in, uh, implementation. So that's really, again, what they do every day. Um, so making sure that they implement the local f uh, funding and developer incentive programs that, that is under their purview, um, making sure that, that they're steward for the current affordable housing and I'll do all this within limited resources. So um, you know they are they are the central point of contact for capital funding applications from developers. So through their Arch Trust Fund as well as the Bellevue's program, and then our upcoming Issaquah uh, includes. No, let me try this again. Uh, oh my gosh, it's IHIP, and I just said it today. So it's the um, Inclusion Housing Policy Investment Pool. Sorry, that was not. The right way to say that, um, but so our those those prod, those uh, applications will all come together um, as one process, um, and then of course with with uh, any organization they're looking at how to make sure that all the members have a parity of their contributions to the benefits they receive and uh, needs that they have. Um, they are going to continue to streamline and modernize how they are addressing the current affordable housing stock. So I know that there's um, a, some other topics that will be coming forward this year about making sure that the rent increases, et cetera, are, um, are thoughtful and strategic for those programs. And then making sure that, uh, the, that there's marketing to uh, inclusive communities to make sure that people are aware of their uh, ability to access um, affordable housing through them. So what are those uh, toolkits that can be developed or other ways that it's not just because you happen to know where Arch is? Oh, my computer is going too fast. So um, again, there is no financial ask this evening, um, and there will basically, uh, if additional staff are added to Arch, th they plan to um, look at this you know, this work plan and implement over time um, and plan to come back to us when we're talking about our work plan with ARCH for 25 and 26 and the budget request to kind of say, this is what we've learned this year in 24, um, and this is what we think is important. So, um, but this is just a list of what potentially could be, um, you know, additional um, st staff uh, added and or requests for costs. Um, and again, this is an approximate of what, you know, taking what they currently do or kind of some quick back of the envelope estimates um, that our share of, an, of one new staff member would be about $10,000. So she's probably going to say, eh, there's lots of ways we, can, we may calculate that, but that just gives you a, a roundabout. So we're not talking $100,000 and not talking $1,000. So um, again, we wanted to provide a little bit of, of context to what that could mean if one, two staff people are added to ARCH. And again, we would have that in our work plan that XYZ would occur if with that additional investment. 
So uh, time and next steps, and actually the timing has changed. So the board is actually gonna vote on the plan in March because there's several other board members that are going to their city councils. And so they wanted to make sure that all the city councils had the opportunity to provide feedback. And then we'll, again, we'll have continuing conversations. We'll work directly with Lindsay and her team to create the 24, 20, or 25, 26 work plan. But we do uh, hope that any feedback you have will help guide us do that. And, um, you know, the budget request will come in as part of the next biennium budget. So um, we're just looking again for any uh, feedback about uh, Arch's approach for their new strategic plan. Thank you. Excellent. So we'll start with questions. Council Member Martz. I don't have any questions. Well, then I'm going to skip you and any questions. Deputy Council President D. Michelle. <laughs> uh, so just, you, uh, I feel like we're, we're talking a little bit vaguely here in that we need a little bit more uh, plain talk, I guess. Maybe Wally can, but I guess what I'm hearing is, and I could be wrong, so please correct me, is you're really wanting to change the structure of ARCH so that elected officials are more engaged? Is that where we're going with this? And um, is that the 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 uh, fix that you're kind of looking at in, ter in terms of changing the the um, governance structure? Um, so it's really not clear from the discussion so far. So if I'm wrong, correct me. Do you mind if I? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So there's. Um, some interrelated strategies. I think governance is one area that the board took a look at, and there's certain things, changes that we want to pursue that are more about streamlining and inefficiencies. Um, and then there are other kind of longer term looking um, aspects of the plan that are about the governance structure overall. Um, I don't think we're identifying, we think there's a a particular problem and a solution, and this is how the governance structure needs to change. It's more we want to explore some of these ideas and talk to elected officials about um, those opportunities, look at how we compare with other regional organizations. Um, but related to that, I think there's a, a aspect of the um, policy and legislative strategies that are a little bit interconnected back with how elected officials collaborate in ARCH and participate in ARCH. And um, I think to Wally's point, we are not trying to get out in front of elected officials and deciding what policies to advocate for on your behalf. We want to hear from you. Um, that's been something we've been trying to uh, accomplish the last few years, talking about funding sources for affordable housing. Um, but we'd like to be able to continue building on that. And it may be it's through a formal workforce, uh, work group or uh, more informal engagement focus groups with elected officials. Um, it kind of depends on the direction of the board and what policy priorities we would potentially be focused on. So hopefully that explains a little bit of the interconnectedness around kind of the governance issues and also the work we're hoping to do on more strategic policy issues. Uh, I'll put a finer point on it. Um, the current membership of the board is the chief executives of the member agencies. So for those that are strong mayor, it's the mayor. Uh, for those that are city managers, the city manager. Um, we get a mix of staff that attend. Um, I don't know that I've ever been present, Lindsay, for a mayor attending uh, as a chief executive. Um, so you have, as, as we would have here in Nisqua, uh, the city administrator looking just at the latest, uh, you know, board minutes. Uh, Redmond had their director of planning and community development, uh, and that's strong mayor. Uh, Clyde Hill, oh, that's a city manager form. Um, what else is strong mayor? Those are the only two. Sorry? Th those are the only two strong mayors. the only mayors. two. So then the, the others are a mix of you know, the, of the city managers we had at the last meeting, Kirkland, Bothell, and Bellevue, and then staff members, either department directors, or I'm not sure what the Intergovernmental Affairs Coordinator in Woodenville does, how far down that is. So, you know, the question is, is that the group that should be representing that? If it's mayors and city managers, and you're not getting mayors and city managers, 
uh, should it be only elected officials then on the ARCH board. Uh, there's the conflict there again because you have strong mayor where the mayor is going to want and the city council is going to want their seat. Um, then the council manager, then you have to have the council pick that. So um, my view as your city administrator sitting on the ARCH board in the time that I've been here, which has been four and a half years, um, it, it, it seems it's become very staff driven. Staff that care deeply about affordable housing and, and move it forward from that perspective. When I think originally it was meant to be the chief executives who uh, hopefully have a broader view of what the, the priorities are in their community. And so I think that is a, a, a major issue. For some, um, it's not an issue at all. And so, you know, how does the strategic plan deal with it? I think, as Lindsay has mentioned, um, you know, there, there is language that would allow further investigation from a variety of different uh, points. Um, you know, the, there's the question regarding additional staffing. Um, you know, what role would that additional staff member have in working with elected officials? Is it information sharing? Is it information gathering? Is it advocacy? Strong, big A advocacy, small A. Um, and is that appropriate for the future of ARCH when there are other groups, nonprofits, other groups of elected officials who gather to talk about these same issues? Um, and so I think this is a real key point, um, looking at a strategic plan to help ARCH, what is its niche moving forward? Okay, I see <laughs> Council Member Ray with a question. So I'll go there. I want you to know I raised my hand before that discussion, but, but my question becomes even that much more interesting to me is why was ARCH formed with the governing body, even if it was chief executives, um, it just seems like almost every other entity that we participate in that's part of an ILA has got um, elected as part of its governing structure. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious why, why ARCH is different. I, I can share just a little bit about how some of the history was explained to me. Um, my understanding is ARCH was set up trying to mirror the structure of local government so that you have um, decision making on policies and funding still happening with the individual city councils, but you have the, the governance and the day-to-day -day work kind of directed by the executive side. Um, we have, you know, our community advisory board was kind of set up to mirror your planning commissions. There, there are just several aspects of ARCH that we're trying to reflect that, but it's obviously more complicated when you've got 16 different jurisdictions um, rather than one. So um, there's there's certainly strong opinions about what's worked well and what um, has been challenges around the model, and I, I do think it's it's part of why we're interested. Um, in the past, there have I'll just say there have been more participation by the, the two strong mayors on Arch's board. Um, that just hasn't been the recent history. So. Some of it is also just about the personnel and the, the kind of the time that we're in and which cities are participating at what levels. Okay, so looking around, seeing if we have any other questions. Obviously, we don't have anybody in the room. Do we have anybody online for public comment? No? Okay, then we can go to feedback led by Councilmember Mertz. Uh, it pains me to say that I think that ARCH has lost its way. In my 15th year on council, I've seen a real drift on what ARCH has focused on. And all this talk of policy, planning, and strategy, putting it front and center is unfortunate. What ARCH should be doing is bringing in money and using that to build housing. Um, the efforts in recent years, the to sort of get the renter's bill of rights stuff done at the local level is an example of doing policy work that isn't about getting more housing into the communities. I think that the measure of success needs to be things like dollar, dollars raised per year for staff, square foot built per year for staff, percentage of dollars going directly to housing, square foot per million dollars spent, these sorts of uh, block and tackling uh, issues. This is what Arch was when I started 15 years ago. It worked well. It served our city well. Um, I don't see that in this plan, draft plan I see in front of us. I see lots of talk of acting like one of the umpteen other 
uh, housing organizations that act regionally and the statewide level. It, this is a hard problem, but we need Arch to build housing on the east side. Thank you. Council Member Hall. Um, I think the plan looks great. I think the strategic plan looks great. There are just two um, initial reactions of, of uh, slight concern that I wanted to share. And the first is, um, just be mindful of, uh, like, when you're considering the role of the elected official, sometimes it's actually best to keep politics out of these kinds of things and have professional management. That was the whole reason the strong council form of government or weak mayor form of government was created in the first place. So um, not that I'll presume which is the right style, but just, you know, something for the board to be mindful of. Um, though I totally agree with, um, I'd say totally on the dire. Uh, I definitely agree with um, finding new and creative ways to engage elected officials, um, whether it's like the kind of informal work group that you were mentioning or, or something else, but that's exciting to think about. Um, and then also mindful, um, Councilmember Mart's point, um, mindful of um, kind of how providing advice on local strategies should be unique to kind of the needs and, and um, the housing makeup of, of a current city. Um, I think there were a couple things that came before council that we were supportive and that we adopted and a couple things that we said might not be as relevant to the city of Issaquah. So understanding that um, being able to provide that kind of unique um, service to a particular city would probably be most helpful, especially to cities on the east side. Um, those are just kind of the two things that I wanted to bring up, but for the most part, I'm. Glad to see that you're going through this 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 process and it's exciting and keep us in the loop. Councilmember Hunt. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, I do participate on some other ILA uh, governance bodies um, as an elected official, and uh, to Councilmember Ray's um, earlier question. I, you know, it does seem to me that there's a reason why a lot of those ILAs have elected officials, that we're the ones who are um, ultimately deciding on the funding, we're making the policy, and so having our, having us in that role um, helps to make the decisions that are made at that level, um, you know, they, they are, um, using the information from the full council, we're able to bring that perspective to those discussions and then we're able to craft proposals that we believe our councils will ultimately vote on. I think that, um, I think there's a lot to be learned from, hopefully, from um, the uh, proposal in 2022 that was um, the arch, uh, arch recommendations on a number of tenant protections, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and in that resolution about those tenant protections in 2022, there was a number of points about that it was in the shared interest of ARCH member jurisdictions to advance common policies promoting and preserving housing affordability. And then again, that um, we should consider adopting consistent local measures. And so I think having, uh, having elected officials in the governance would better advance those kinds of um, those kinds of values where we want to have that buy-in from the electeds who are ultimately going to be making the decisions. And so for that reason, I, I um, appreciate this being brought forward. I strongly feel that the electeds in the governance of this should be, um, should be considered uh, at the forefront. And I think that would then lead to more discussions about, you know, electeds bringing forward that we need the more housing and, and this is what we will support within our council. And so then those proposals will be the ones that are most likely to um, advance within each member city. So for that reason, I, I think we should, I would urge that the strategic plan take that direction. Deputy Council President D. Michelle. Yes, I agree with those remarks. Uh, so just to let you know, Lindsay and I met, was it last summer? Uh, and uh, talked about our mutual organizations, the Aside Human Services Forum and ARCH, because we were, I was picking her very wise brain. Uh, and because there's some very common things that we were talking about in terms of governance. 
Um, and I agree totally that uh, you bring elected officials to the conversation because, you know, we're the ones that have to go out and ring doorbells and talk to co community members and feel the urgency. You know, I, if you talk to people in the community, you feel the urgency about we really need affordable housing. And I think that elected officials bring that to the, to the um, table. Um, Eastside Human Services Forum has also struggled with how do we bring all of these different community perspectives to single public policy. And I think that is a, another conversation that you need to have um, because um, not all of us on the east side agree with every direction. I think the Sound Cities Association has a very good way of bringing a lot of people together discussing public policy and coming together, and maybe it happens rarely, but coming together when they all agree. Um, and I think Sound Cities Association has the policy of we don't do anything that harms any one of our members. So having those agreements in place, I think is really important. Um, and I think this conversation, it's, it's a great conversation. Because if you can bring everybody together to agree on a forward policy, then it really is powerful. And you've got all of your, your communities bought into it. So I definitely would um, like to see ARCH go in that direction, get a stronger involvement. Uh, people at the table who are elected officials bring that community perspective. But it is a challenge to figure out then how do we get all these voices to uh, come together around a single policy and then move that policy forward. So, uh, but I, I think elected officials bring that broad perspective and that's, that's really important. We love our staff members, but <laughs> like I said, we're the ones out knocking on people's doors. So anyway, that would be my, my feedback. And um, uh, I just wanna also say, uh, I think Arch has done some really meaningful things. I know as a member, former member of the board at Together Center, that was a huge investment in that project. And then we have the investment in our own TOD here. So this is a really important organization and we want to get it right, right? So uh, good luck to you <laughs> with your strategic plan. But I would, uh, I would also support bringing more elected officials in. Okay, before I make my comments, checking in with uh, oh, can you turn off? Uh, Councilmember Joe and Councilmember Ray, seeing if any comments there. Seeing any? Well, that gives me freedom to just move ahead. Um, so I'm on the King County Affordable Housing Committee. I care about this so, 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 so very much. Um, and I would also echo that Art has been super powerful in doing the important things of building housing and maintaining um, and shepherding the affordable housing that we have. Um, one of the things that the King County Affordable Housing Committee has done since it's in its five year and is kind of doing that reevaluation. Um, did a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. And one of the things really looked at is, what are things that maybe we don't do as well? Um, and I'm not seeing as much of that here. And so that's something that I would really like to evaluate um, or have the group at Arch evaluate because you can't do everything. And it's really important to understand where your strengths are. And so if I was to evaluate Arch's strengths, I would say you've got a lot of strength in bringing together really important segments of cities in the area to work together toward a common goal of affordable housing with funding. Maybe you need to evaluate what that funding model looks like for everybody to do more in that area, but you have the group and you've been able to prove that out by building housing. Those are really important strengths to lean on, um, where I think there has been a little bit of a challenge is in that 
um, policy advocacy area. And so I think I agree with um, the other council members that getting electeds on board um, to help evaluate those and smooth out some of those areas um, before moving forward is probably a good idea. Similarly, I will say I just don't support the idea of ARCH adding to staffing to do state policy advocacy. I think there are a lot of state legislators who are doing a lot in that area. We've seen a lot of action in the last few years. We also have some other regional organizations such as the Puget Sound Regional Council or Sound Cities Association that are a little bit higher up and can do more of that data gathering um, and some of those ideas that I just think are better placed. Similarly, the Affordable Housing Committee decided that that wasn't going to be a big part of their role because there are other organizations that do that better. Um, so I would just put a point that I think it's really super important to keep housing investment um, on you know, working on those local things that these cities need. I don't know what's going on with mics, but we'll see. Um, and then the other I would put in there is that the decision criteria map um, that you've included in your um, draft, I think is really useful. I think it's it says a lot that you've included that in there, but I think it's only valuable if you do agree that other organizations may do something better than you. And so I think it's really important to be able to take that look inwards and also outwards and recognize that if the goal isn't for you to do everything, it's really important to use that decision criteria to decide what your strengths are, what you should be doing more of, and what you can let other organizations do instead. So that would be my feedback. Uh, looking again at council, and then I guess back at the administration, do you guys have what you need moving forward? I think so. Um, you know, pr very much appreciate your, your comments and thoughts. Um, as I said at the outset, we are one of many. Um, and so I, my takeaway is to, to continue advocating on behalf of what I think are some common themes that I've heard from the council this evening, and uh, I'll keep you posted. Excellent. Well, we are well served with uh, that and having Arch leadership here, much appreciated. Uh, I think with that, last item on our agenda is go to the order. Anybody have anything to add? Fantastic. Okay. Well, then I will say we are adjourned at 9.23 p.m. Thank you.